Hello and welcome to another episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, you're joined by your boy, Happy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And as usual, we want to give a massive shout out to all of our incredible sponsors who help ensure the show continues to happen. Seeds here now, your number one seed bank in the industry, all the hottest breeders, the latest drops, everything you can look for and more. Whether you're after indoor, outdoor, feminized, regular, auto flower, they've got everything under the sun to keep you loaded on all the hottest genetics, producing the most fire bud you've ever had. I hear they've got some incredible lines from Heavy Days still in stock. If you want to go check that out, make sure to do it before it's too late. Big shout out to CT now. We appreciate you so much. Likewise, if you want to produce the best bud to date, you've got to make sure your garden is pumping on all cylinders. And for that, we recommend our good friends at Organics Alive. They produce the number one powdered organic products that will ensure your next crop is the absolute best to date. People are picking up cups all around the globe using their products, which is the highest accolade you can get. Home growers just like you producing Not only their best harvest to date, but award-winning harvest. What more could you ask for? They've got solutions, whether you're in veg, transition, flower. They've got micronutrients, macronutrients, absolutely every product you could want, ferments and more. Check them out, guys. Organics Alive, your number one stop for all of the highest quality organic inputs to make sure your harvest is killing it. Likewise, you've got to make sure your garden is pest and pathogen free to ensure that your plants are happy and producing the highest quality harvest. For that, we recommend you check out our good buddies at Copet. They've partnered with us for a long time and we have no doubt that if you use their products, you will find they are the absolute best in the game. You've got to check out the Spidex Vital Plus Breeder Sachets. These are an absolute game changer. It's the usual Spidex Vital you know and love that's going to take out any spider mite problems you have, but the Breeder Sachets allow a continuous, sustained release of these beneficial predators into your garden, ensuring that you don't just have one big burst and surge, but instead a consistent rate of release. Truly a game changer. I expect nothing less from the experts at Copet Biological. You know these guys are world leaders. They're not just in America, they're all around the world and for good reason. They are the pinnacle of the game. If you're after biological pest control, check out Copet. Number one, thank you so much for the support. The final piece of the puzzle to ensure that your room is killing it is our good friends at Pulse. Their sensors are second to none. Industry leading and just recently they announced the Pulse Hub. What more could you want? An integrated unit for all of your sensors to ensure that your garden is automated and tracking all of the variables you may not be consciously aware of. From VPD to PPF, dew point, temperature, humidity, so much more. You've got to get yourself a pulse sensor, guys. It has revolutionized the way I grow flower and increased the terpene content, the cannabinoid content, the yield, so, so, so much more. Shout out, as always, to our friends at Pulse Sensors. Likewise, if any of you guys have been listening to the show, you know that I am passionate about helping people transition to vaporized options if they're considerate about their respiratory health. And for me, Dynavap are the world leaders in this. Dynavap helped me to transition from bongs to vaping. And I tell you what, I've never looked back. Their unit is the most potent, the most highly replicating of a bong hit I've ever come across. And through their incredible M unit, I was able to successfully get off bongs a few years ago now. Truly one of the most innovative and interesting vapes on the market using a totally different design to others you've found. Please check out Dynavap. I promise you guys, if you've tried vaping before and felt like it didn't quite cut it, check these guys out. You will not be disappointed. Massive shout out to Dynavap. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we want to give a massive shout out to the incredible Patreon gang. Without you guys, we could not continue to make episodes. If you want to get early access to upcoming episodes, exclusive content just on the Patreon, including the likes of Mean Gene, Bob Hemphill, Bodhi, Trichome Jungle, so much more, be sure to go check out our Patreon. We give away genetics every month to our supporters along with artwork, vapes, sensors, so much more. Please check out the Patreon, guys. I promise you, you won't regret it. You'll get your money back in swag for helping support a show you love. Thank you so much to everyone from the Patreon. We appreciate you so greatly. On today, we are joined by none other, Skunk VA. Here to talk all things Lucky Dog Seed Co. along with the newest venture he's a part of, 
The Grateful Head, a clone bank and genetic repository, some big aspirations. So without further delay. Alrighty gang, welcome back. On today, we are thrilled to have a longtime friend, a prolific grower and breeder, the man behind Lucky Dog Seed Co. and a part of the newest adventure I'm sure you've heard of, The Grateful Head. A big welcome to Skunk BA for taking the time to join us today. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm well. I'm well. As always, I want to know, what have you been smoking on recently? Uh, lately, I've been smoking a lot of uh, live rosin, uh, you know, decarboxylated in my pens that I've been buying, you know, so I've been on the, I've been busy. So I've been smoking Jack's Cleaner of all things. Wow. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. So I've been growing it a little bit. It's really ugly flower. It's just, it's not pretty at all. But it makes incredible, incredible live rosin, you know. So I put some in the toaster oven, and you know, I, I was trying to find some devices for the uh, live rosin pens that we we sell here at Lucky Dog Cannabis. And you know, I chose that. I took like forty. I took like um, forty grams of the live rosin I made and melted it in the toast oven and put it in the pens to kind of test out the devices and you know, passing them out to the employees and my friends and smoking them myself. So. It just tastes so damn good. I did have to. I did have to keep it in there a little bit longer to kind of mellow out the extra energy side of it. It's a little woo, you know. <laughs> so I kind of got a little bit of that to come out of it when I just kind of left it in there for a little bit longer, decarbox it just a bit longer, you know. Um, and yeah, so that's what I've been smoking. And then on the on the uh, the flower front, I've been smoking a lot of uh, sour band. I know we've been we had a nice crop of that here. I've actually been smoking a lot of Jack Herrera, rolling joints to that. So that's like my morning time thing. I go out in the sunshine, get about fifteen minutes on my face, and smoke a little Jack Herrera. And then usually at night, it's something like desserty. I like to have like a desserty thing at night. Um, oh, and then uh, another one that we're that we're gonna that we have over here that I've been loving is called Triple Burger. Skunk Master Flex, nice. Yeah. And uh, someone passed me a cut of it up here and some live rosin of it there. And we also have been dabbing that. And it's fucking, it's really nice. Really enjoying that savory flavor. I hear it's got some sort of chem in it. I'm not, I don't really know the lineage of it, but it definitely tastes like it's got, let's just say chem D in it. You know, it's got that savory. It's got GMO. GMO. There you go. Yeah. I said, you nailed it with the chem D. Yeah, it's it, it's it's nice though. I like it. So we're gonna be rocking that one here too. Um, yeah, that's about it. That's so cool to hear you've been uh, getting into concentrates. I got to ask you some more. Like, are there any other sort of standout strains you've put into the pens? And you reference with the uh, Jack's Cleaner. Like, was it that it was like a bit racy in the way like sativas were when you say you were trying to mellow it? Because it's really interesting. You don't hear about people say, "Oh, you put anything into a pen, it just feels like an indica." Um, so that sounds like you were getting more of that sativa expression. Yeah, I, it was my first time decarboxylating the live rosin myself. And I, you know, at first I just let it go. I was trying to get every little itty bitty bubble out of it. So I think I let it go for like probably way too long. Um, and then so it kind of just naturally happened. Um, but I did have some of the the rosin that wasn't decarboxylated. And I, I did a dab and I was like, that's a different feeling. You know, it was way more racier. Um, it wasn't too much, but like I said, uh, you know, I don't, I don't smoke that in the morning. I, so I, the pen is kind of throughout the day. Sure. So you, you were saying you mostly use the pens through the day. I'd love to know, have you ventured much into the world of like hash, dry sieve, anything like that? Or are you sticking mostly to like the more concentrate-esque? No, we, we have been making, we've been setting aside a little bubble hash when I make the, I make all the live rosin here. Um, just don't have anyone else to do it, you know? Um, but so yeah, I, I always set a little bubble aside. I love having a freeze dryer, man. It's kind of a new thing for me. It's like I wish I would have had that all along. You know, <laughs> it's so amazing. It's amazing to come back the very next day and like pull out some dry hash, bubble hash, and you know, melt it up. You know, so yeah, I've been keeping. I've been doing some tits, some purple full stack. We did some red dog. That one came out really nice. Not a big yielder, so it's probably not going to be something in the rotation. It's one of ours, the lucky dog uh crosses that we made um we found a really nice one it's it, it tests around 29 percent thc whatever that means to anybody but
but it's got this beautiful flavor to it, like this almost like green weed flavor to it that's kind of rare these days. Um, and it's got this incredible, like, relaxing effect. Um, the people who come in, it's been really popular. Like our last drop, the ones that were flowering out here have been really popular. Our, our most popular is Diesel Poison and Red Dog. We can't, we can't grow enough of that all of a sudden. And they're kind of surpassing all the the boutiques and the old chems that we have and you know some of my old classics that i've got um which makes me so happy i love that you know people that don't know anything about lucky dog or really even chem dog or like any of the stuff that goes any of the history or anything like that they'll come in and they'll buy stuff that we've selected from our own you know crosses and it just it really validates what you're doing you know it really does because it's like there's no bias there there's no you know, preconceived notions at all. It's just simply, you know, this is the one I like and they, you know, they asked for it and they're bummed out. We don't have it. So I made, I did a little bit of that, some red dog, except purple full stack and diesel poison. We did some pull dog there, the skunk dog cross and uh, the tits GMO, which, you know, always makes some really nice fucking rosin or bubble hash. And, uh, that's about that's all I can think of right off the top of my head. It's really not that much, but oh, and uh, we have one called um, um, Dog Roller that we made. That one's in is, is also in rosin form too. That's like a heavy duty, strong indica. So yeah, I feel like you're telling yourself short. You're like that's that's not that much. It's like there's a plethora of killers in that mix there. So. <laughs> Sounds like you got some good concentrates on board. I guess I want to ask, given you're trying all of different variety, if you had to pick one as your favorite, which would you go with currently? The out of the ones I've made uh, that I currently have, I'd say probably the tits. It's always been my favorite ever since I smoked it. As far as concentrates goes, it's just it's good any time of the day. Generally, I smoke it in the daytime, but. Um, you know, it's 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 just got that it's got the flavor. It stays in your mouth. It coats it. It just stays with you. Makes your mouth water, and it's just got the nice high. You know, it's a really rare plant. It's got it all. You know, so I'd say the tits. That always is going. I'm going back to. I got one of those uh, Puffco the pipes. You know, what do you call them? The proxies. You know, and so you know. If I'm feeling saucy, you know, we have to worry about inspectors here. So we can't just walk around with those pipes in our hands around here. You know what I mean? It's a legal cannabis business. So that's why the pens come in handy, of course. You know, it's not something that we prefer. It's just something that we kind of, it's a, a ways to a means, you know. Um, but uh, I do like I do like smoking the, the tits rosin out of that thing. It's really nice. You can really get a good, the good flavor. The full, the full flavor comes through with no water in it and such, you know. That's awesome. And and just to loop back, you were mentioning with the flower, you were having Jack Herrer and some Sour Band. Sounds like you're starting to gravitate more to the sativa end of the spectrum, or is it just in the daytime? No, I am actually. You know, I, as I've gotten older, it's it's just uh, I'm not sure if it's because I wasn't so exposed to it when I was, you know, you know, 20s and 30s, just too much chem around me. Not to say that it doesn't have sativa qualities. We all know it does, but um but some of these I just didn't have access to and um, maybe I would have enjoyed them back then. But yeah, I, I do gravitate towards them. I like that uppity feeling, you know, I, the older I've gotten, I'm 51 now and I like that, that energized feeling. It, it, it does me well. And I like that brain stimulation, you know, um, you know, kind of creativity, you know, problem solving kind of effects. I love that. You know, I like to see things differently. I love when weed does that to me. So I get that a lot from the sativas I smoke, and I, I do like them. I've been breeding a lot more sativas too, you know. That was going to be my next question. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, you know, like the pole dog, for instance, that's definitely, you know, and the diesel poison. The diesel poison has just been like a big surprise. Like we just packed, we, uh, we took one pack, 13 seeds, germinated them, grew them out. We could have kept three of them, but there was one that just, it, you know, the the problem with, Breeding with anything that's high in terpenoline is, of course, I think we've talked about this before. It, it dominates everything, you know. Um, you know, a lot of people, that's what weed smells like because that's all they remember when they, from the times they smelled weed, you know. But uh, so when you're able to make a cross, because it, it's a great, it's a great flavor. It's a great smell. It does like, do, it does a lot of things to you. I don't, I can't even explain it. But um, to be able to have that in, in a strain, 
in the flavor, in the aroma, but not dominating. And you can have like, you know, different smells, different flavors on the back end. And that's what this does. It's really cool, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we pulled that one off. It's a huge yielder. You know, it just wrecks you. People love it. And so I would say that's, you know, that's one of the ones that I'm thinking about right now. Uh, but we also did the pulled dog with the skunk dog. It's definitely a sativa leaner. I mean, the skunk dog itself is just by itself is uh, it's got almost medicinal benefits when it comes to things like ADHD. You know, it's so focusing, you know, um, I've had people come into the shop here. I think I've told you this before where, you know, that's why they smoke her because they have severe what they call ADHD. And, you know, certain strains can really lock them in and, and change their day when it comes to production. And, and uh, we've had people give us feedback like that on on the pull dog. Um, so, you know, and I enjoy those now too. They, I used to be kind of scared of those cause I don't really want to like have a heart racing, you know, like, whew, like near panic attack feel. But nowadays I don't know if I enjoy it or if it's just different, but I, I kind of enjoy it, you know? Yeah. I know you do too. Well, you know, it's, I've thought about that a lot because, you know, there was a time where if I had any of these sativas, I would just feel profoundly anxious and not enjoy it at all. And, my conclusion I've come to is that I think over time you learn to harness that feeling and use it as like you feel energized and productive, you know, whereas in other situations it feels like almost a bit crippling. Um, so that that's just my anecdotal sort of musings on it because I have thought about that. Like why did it used to make me anxious but the same clone nowadays it's like, oof, Oh, perfect. Uh I think that maybe that's a good point uh, for me, too, because, you know, maybe when I was younger, I I certainly I'm I'm, I'm, I would say I don't want to say I'm busier because I physically maybe I'm not as busy, but mentally I'm busier than I've ever been in my life. And so maybe it just fits better with my life now because of that. Whereas when I was younger, I'm at home, you know, I got my bedrooms, you know, and growing the weed, hanging out with my, my kid, my little kid, you know, and maybe, maybe that's what it was. Maybe it's just that you need to have the right kind of day to have that kind of smoke in your life, you know, production wise. Definitely. Definitely. And you know what? Uh, the listeners are probably sick of hearing me say this, but uh, what you said about the diesel poison being like unexpectedly popular uh, is, is really a, a sentiment I'm always mentioning to people, which is that that, notion that people are burnt out on blue dream or jack hair or train wreck um it i really don't think it applies outside of california because the majority of people and they're just not exposed to it so i I see people in australia all the time growing durban poison s1 blue dream s1 train wreck s1 because they're very much interested in it so yeah i think it it mirrors what your sort of experience is that like there are a lot of people who are still really into terpenaline profiles and love the high and think yeah this is for me i would agree with that i, I didn't mean to cut you off I, I would agree with that um yeah california market's different than all the others i've, I've been exposed to and been around um i don't really know what it is you know it's a big place with a lot of people and they do drive markets outside of their own you know uh but but i i've said that here i was surprised when i came here i was blown away because i've never really seen that and then when i came here and opened up shop you know, people were looking for the sativas and they still are, you know, and so we intentionally grow more and more of them. You know, the traditional classical classic sativas, we grow more and more of those because that's what they want, you know, which is it's not purple weed, you know, like California. I don't know how it is today. Things can change. But when I call back there, it's all about the purple weed. Is it purple? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe <laughs> how cold is it? But yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with what you said. I think it is. I think it is an outside California thing, which is literally everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, look. I guess the next question is: Would you ever consider maybe developing a male that's like you know hybrid sativa? I think we have. We 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 selected a Kim Fuego that seems to pass on the best parts of the sour diesel when it comes to those effects. You know. Um, We've done a lot of, we just finished doing a lot of crosses for those. We're going to test them out, see if they landed where we want. Um, but that's, that's, that's kind of what we've been doing. You know, uh, we definitely are, are developing more males here, um, slowly but surely, you know. Uh, but we're trying to expand 
what we're doing. We know, of course, we're Kim Dog based here. We always will be. It's just the way it is. But um, but we have we have started to do that. And I would say I feel pretty good about this, this next line that we're going to be coming out with as far as the that Kim Fuego mail that we selected. You know, if the Kim Fuego has been out for quite a while. It's probably the most popular one I've ever I've ever made as far as what I can see. Um, and so decided to kind of look into it a little bit more. Uh, been collecting clones of it, been selecting more females of it, um, and have gone through a few males. So we just we're literally drying a bunch of flower seeded flower right now, <clears throat> and we're gonna start testing them out later this summer. We'll start popping them. Wow, that's exciting! I've I've had a few friends grow some Chem Fuego out, and they've all loved it. So that's that's really exciting. I guess I'd love to know: Are there any? Uh, particular crosses in the mix that you did that like you know you i know that like when i make seeds you know there's like say you make 10 crosses there's like there's two in your mind where you're like oh i'm really those are the ones i'm keen on tell me what are they for you well honestly i've been through this and i try not to do that because i disappoint myself you know um i did some red lebanese hash plant crosses and they were phenomenal, but there was a little bit higher intersex traits than I prefer, you know. So I've uh, I've thought about kind of because they were really they were they were off the chain, but I got I got hung up on what I saw as far as I go. It wasn't wasn't terrible, but it was, you know, when we stressed, you know, what we do is stress. We just use mo mostly we use what I've learned is that when you find those, it's mostly uh, root bound plants, you know. Sometimes I can't get heat to do it, you know, excessive heat, but I can get a plant in a solo cup to do it, you know. And so I, I, we, you know, we were testing them with smaller pots, and we did find that. Um, basically, if I find two and, like, say, you know, 30 or 50, I don't really have numbers on that, but somewhere in that range, that's too much for me. Um, you know, but we have thought about putting those out. So, anyways – I was so I had such high expectations on that one that I got really disappointed when I saw that. Of course, I never released the stuff, um, so I try to stay away from that. But we did just make a shit ton of crosses. I'm trying to think if I had a favorite, if I could pick one. Um, I don't know, man. Like, there's so many. We just did a bunch of different stuff. I mean, I don't even have to get the list out to tell you it's like that. You know, there's there's like 26 different ones that we we rocked. You know. But I did like I did have a lot of problems with the banana OG. That was kind of a outside of my realm, and we started to do a little cro like crossing with some things we've made. It's females we've selected of our own stuff, like the dog roller, um, the uh, the diesel poison, like I mentioned, the pole dog, you know, things like that. We're starting to cross into that and see what we find there. Maybe there's gonna be some good shit there, but um, nothing really that I feel like. I just try not to fall in love. It's like, you know, I. I, I get, I can, I can go, I can get all emotional about something pretty quick. So I try to check myself and, you know, play it out and let things just kind of, you know, and try not to have too high of expectations, big or low, you know? Yeah, certainly, certainly. I always think to myself, like, I'll have a few favorites and maybe one or two of them will pan out to be what I hoped and maybe the others don't. And then there'll always be one that, I wasn't particularly invested in that proves to be like one of the really good pairings. And so I guess it's kind of what you're saying, you know, like it's just, it, <laughs> you can't really call it either way. No. Cause I mean, you more, more times than not, I get surprised, you know, like this is not one that I had a lot of hope in and then boom, there it is, you yeah. know? So I, I kind of just to stay out of that, you know, I've learned to do that with many things in my life, even with this. There you go. And I, I wanted to ask, I saw, I believe, in your stories or somewhere that you're looking to retire the BX2 mail and upgrade to the BX3 only. Tell me a bit about it. You know, it just, it, it came down like this. Like, I kept them both because I when I made different crosses with each one, you know, the same cross, but with the, each uh, male, you know, sometimes I would find better qualities or, and traits in one versus the other. And often, sometimes it was the BX2 that was that had the the better traits, and so I figured, well, we better keep it around. But it wasn't that it wasn't like that big of a difference. And as time went on, the more we did that, the more we looked, it really was like it became like obvious. Like we've moved on from it, you know. So we just we retired it. He's gone now. We don't even have him anymore. We decided to put him down. So um, it just 
maybe a little bit too like overthinking it. Um, and then after that was over, it was like, well, we don't really need this anymore. So let's let it go. You know, I crossed with the Kim sis and, you know, I couldn't tell which one was better. I felt at one time that the, uh, the, the BX two was better. And so I kept that one. That was probably the one that made me keep it the most. Like that was the one I was like, Oh, I think, you know, I like this better. So I'm going to keep this. But, you know, time and space and, like, space is a big thing, and we just don't have room for it anymore. We, get, we want to put more males in. So uh, there was nothing really wrong with it. It was just, like, it just kind of was, like, what's the point, you know? So I, I decided to retire it, you know? No, that makes sense. And I guess the, the next question is, do you have any plans to make a BX4? Well, I've made a BX4. Um, and then, what would that have been? 2009, what was it? 2019 when i was still in sonoma county we had the fires come through really close and we had to be evacuated and i was i just taken clones of everything to replace all my mothers um and the evacuations became mandatory and where i was living at the time it was like at a very high vantage point in sonoma county i could actually see the fires which as a bird flies maybe 20 miles away maybe not even and you know when those when those, um, what do they call those things? The uh, El Diablo, is that what they call those winds? El Diablo winds come through. They can get so strong, and this happens quite often. I think it's happening right now in Northern California. Um, when it hap- when that happens, and it happens in you know, September, October, the winds gusts can be so dry, the humidity can drop so low, and the winds can be so powerful that they can do this phenomenon. I figure what they call it, but where the fire jumps from treetop to treetop. And it can spread so fast at that point that, you know, you really literally have to keep an eye on it. You like the evacuations make sense when that kind of situation arises, something they can't predict. Um, So we, you know, I grow weed. So I stayed put during the mandatory evacuations, no power. You know, the power's already been off for a few days before these evacuations come uh, because of the fire. And luckily for me, I had everything rooted in rock wool. And so I, I, what I did is I set up my RV with my sunlight, my skylight. I put the clones in. I, you know, I don't put them in there because I have a generator, but I have a spot ready for them in case I have to blaze really quick. I fill up the R. Uh, this is like something became like, um, you know, a, a regular occurrence. You know, something we had to do all the time. Set, it, you know, put all the finance, you know, the, all the papers, all the important papers, all the photos, the crystals, the CD collection, all in the RV and waiting for us to evacuate and then i put the rv in front of my location and then i would hide the generators between you know behind the rv between the house hiding them from the street because it's a mandatory evacuation we're not supposed to be there so we would go up to the top of the hill on foot and we would watch and see how the fire's doing we could also see if any authority law enforcement or fire department was coming up the hill um because we're not supposed to be there and then we would shut the generators off we also had solar uh, battery so we could have all of our lights and refrigerators and you know our refrigerator and stuff on but no grow lights and we would shut all that shit off before they got to our street you know it was a fucking cat and mouse game um so it went on for almost i, I believe that time it was like 10 week, 10 days you know it was a long time um there's a lot going on you're not really you shouldn't if you drive away from your house you can't come back that's another thing, <laughs> you know. So once you leave, you can't come back. You Once you leave, you have to be ready to, to not come back. Um, so food, all that water, all these things, you know, you have to be ready for that. And when that happened, I, I didn't lose anything except for the BX4 that I was working on. Um, I didn't really get a lot of that feedback on it yet. I didn't find do a lot of testing with it. I did cross with the headband, and we released it at that Harvest uh, Cup in Worcester, uh, was it that year? I think it was that year. It's right before COVID. But anyway, um, so, and then once I lost it, I just kind of, I kind of haven't gone down that road. So, um, you know, with what we're doing next, there's going to be a lot of clone only's released and I'm working constantly on, you know, the backs, you know, in the background of my life, I'm just working on an IBL, a chem dog IBL. And it's kind of like, I feel like it's going to, maybe never happen or it's going to take the rest of my life to make it happen and so the bx4 was part of that um we we are getting ready to go through all the rest of the bx3 seeds that i have 
uh, to select females and maybe to take the, fem the male one more step. I'm going to spray the male. I'm going to spray the males that I select and kind of figure out what we got from that. Do maybe do some testing here with the lab, the local lab here, um, terpenes, cannabinoids. Um, once we reverse it, if that seems like a good idea at the time. But right now, with everything else going on, it's just kind of like on a side burner, you know. There you go. And I, I wanted to ask, I've seen some cool crosses popping up in your stories, like some some pollinated mums for some upcoming projects, I guess. And the thing that sort of grabbed my attention the most was there was quite a few mums in there that were like new to the arsenal and I, I wasn't necessarily expect them to pop up. And I think I saw just a bit earlier, there's a grape and cream cross chemdog BX3. Tell me a little bit about some of these new mums that have joined the ranks. So, yeah, uh, what we have driving right now is we have the Four Kings OG. All right. We have 501 OG. Then we did our 88 G13 Chem Selection. Uh, then we've got our Banana OG. That's a new one for us here. We had it a long time ago, but now we've got it again. So we crossed with the Black Triangle Caps Frozen Lemons. Kind of so-so on that one. Carbon Candy, that's a new one for us. We, we had a selection of Kim Cornelian, that's our Cherry Pie Kim and Dog Cross. Um, we have a Kimborn 13 selection in there. Like I said, we did a lot of our own selections in there. Um, so that's our Airborne G13 Cross with Kim 91 BX3. Uh, we did our Chewy, that's our Runts, a White Runts Cross with our Kim Dog, our selection of that. Deep End Butter, which is a friend, uh, my buddy Gabby, you know Gabby, and we've talked with him before. He gave that to me. Um, our Diesel Poison selection, and we did our Dog Beach selection. That's our Virginia Af Afghani, Virginia Beach Afghani cross selection. The Dog Roller I mentioned before, and then we've got our GMO Root Beer. Everybody loves that one, so we got that one in there. Gorilla Glue number four. We have a Gorilla Glue number four that was recently taken out of uh, off a of Gen Zero cut. So that's super duper like healthy and vibrant. So we went ahead and crossed it. The gate, the grape gas, the grapes and cream. It's it. I don't know if you heard of that one. It's it. Yep, that's. Uh, I believe it's an uh, exotic mic. I think. Yeah, I believe it's exotics. Yeah, we like that one. We got that one from Gabby as well. Joker 31 figured why not? We did the Killer Queen. You'll be happy to hear. La Bamba number two. I believe that's another one of uh, exotics. I'm not sure. No, that's a uh, compound. Yeah. And then we had uh, we, uh, my my lady found a nice selection of Larry OG by SFV OG. So we got that one in there. And then uh, Larry Unicorn. We've got that one in there. I believe, well, we have uh, one of uh, uh, Tommy's uh, local H in there that we have. The Mac 1 actually took the pollen. Looks like we got a, quite a few seeds off the Mac 1. We tried that one. And then the next one, we took the, the classic, the Maui Wowie, NorCal Gooey, two classics right there in a row. And then we took the Orange Tree, which is one I got from Gabby, and he, uh, he got it from a guy, Mark, we know, up in Mendocino. From Green Brothers Farms, give him a little shout out there because I know he loves that orange tree. And then orangutan titties, another exotics, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Pull dog number six. That was our four percent terps selection. Uh, Twenty nine, thirty percent on the THC total. So we put that one in there. And then my lady made some F twos of the punchy blooster. Uh, so we selected a net, one of the one of her F twos. Put that in there. Purple full stack, purple panther, and then we had a selection of our Raffy dog, which is our uh, apples and bananas cross. Um, mum, 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 RS eleven. Why not? And then we did another one of Tommy's screaming eagle. And then we did a lot of like increases, you know, um, popular ones like we did a. Uh, uh, some Gorilla Fume. Um, what else did we do? I think there was another one I'm trying to think of. We did. We may have done some with Diesel Poison. I'm sorry, uh, Diesel Therapy, East Coast Sour Diesel, and Slaps. 
That was from Gabby. And then we did the slice. Have you ever heard of that one? That was one that I think Tommy made. Calio, right? Yeah, Calio and his skunk mail. Mm. And then do, 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 do. we did a strawberry diesel. We're hoping we can put some more pow, pump oomph into that. And Talimon. So the Talimon has been a nice one. That one's like a 7% uh, yielder on the the lot on the uh, fresh frozen yield. Wow. Really high yield. Not familiar with them, a lot of, I believe that's also exotic. I'm not sure. I have to check with Gabby on some of those. Those are cuts that he all, that he passed, Jimmy. He loves his exotic, doesn't he? He, I guess he does, yeah. I don't, he's got a, you know, his library is surprising knowing him, you know. I don't know. Yeah, he's a. Uh, He's turned me on some some new shit. I like that. Mm, yeah, very surprising, unexpected. But he's turned me on some newer, newer school stuff, you know. And then uh, another one for my lady, her selection of Triangle Kush by Irene. And then that's and then we did the White Widow, the Sharon cut. We did, yeah. Uh, a lot of people have been asking about that one, so I figured we'll we'll run that one. I believe there's some other ones, but those are those are all the ones I can find, right? I mean, while we're on that topic, before we transition, what, what's your thoughts on the future of flour? Do you feel like demand's growing, falling? Where do you see flour? I don't know if I have a good perspective of that, but my perspective is is that it's the same as it ever was. That there's some people who just want cheap weed to get high with, and there's some people who, you know, want the connoisseur grade weed. Um, I think that when you have those two types of consumers, I think you're always going to get more exposed to the one who wants to save a few bucks on a Friday afternoon before their weekend, you know, um, so they have the most joints possible to smoke during the weekend. But there's still that, you know, we get people out here and they come to the shop that fly from, you know, pretty far away and, and we happen to be part of their trip, you know, here at Lucky Dog. You know, Bozeman, Montana is a, um, it's a tourist destination you know the yellowstone parks here um for the summertime and then in the wintertime we have some great skiing snowboarding here at big sky and bridger bowl and so we do get a lot of tourism here that's basically the industry that that, that this town has if it has one this area it's not really just this town but this area and so you know just a funny little story about that so in february this guy i think he called the shop he found the shop like on google you know called it up he talked to my employee, Sarah, and he, he's like, hey, do you guys have any chem dog? And she's like, well, you know, we don't really keep that. It's hard for us to keep that on the shelf. It sells out really quick. Um, but we have a little bit. Are you coming by today? He's like, no, I'm in Connecticut, and I'll be there like in a month. <laughs> so she's like, okay. So he, she says, well, we have like a half an ounce of it. That's about it, though, you know. And so he's like, will you save it for me? And she's like. Yeah, let me ask. Uh, let me ask. You know, the boss. So she asked me. I'm like, yeah, of course. I mean, that'd be interesting if he actually shows up and gets it. <laughs> so let's see what happens. So he did. He comes back like you know a month, or he comes like in a month, and you know he brings his wife, and they're on vacation. They're gonna go snowboarding or skiing or whatever, and you know just check out the hot springs, and you know just go have some Montana moments, you know, as we say here, and uh, and stop by the shop and got his got all laced up with gear you got the hoodies and the shirts and the fucking bought a bunch of flour him and his wife did and and i i remember just looking at his wife and she was like what the fuck she was just looking at like i just kept catching this look like what are we doing like this is what we came for you know and he gets his half ounce of kim dog that we put away for him you know it was the last bit we had and um so he, he that all happens we take pictures it was a big deal and then just yesterday, coincidentally, just yesterday, we get a package in the mail, and it's from this fella. And uh, and so he sends us, he had like these tie-dyes made. He was a 49ers fan like myself, and we were talking about that when he was here. And he had these tie-dyes made with like a pot leaf on it. And and then the rest of the background's red, gold, you know, like the 49ers color. And then he wrote a little note saying, hey, you know, we're both 49ers fans, and I appreciate the, you know, you guys saving the weed for me. And here's shirts for everybody. It was like five shirts in the thing, you know? And so, like, That's awesome. we get a lot of that, you know? So my perspective is a little skewed because of stuff like that, you know? Um, but so, but I would say on the daily, like, people just want to, like, they just want to relax. They want the effect of weed. You know, they want to, they don't want to break the bank on it. Although the weed is about as cheap as you can 
you know, as you can fucking produce it and sell it for. But um, I don't know. I think it's about the same. If anything, there's more people smoking. Um, I'm not even sure if that's true, actually. But in, in my perspective, there's probably more people smoking, and they're probably a different customer than I've ever been around. They're just they just want to get their their herb and they want to like you know enjoy it and you know kind of that's their thing and they don't want to spend a lot of money on it so if they want to get like older weed or smalls as you say you know then they'll take that if it's a, at a discount and then there's people that just want the best you know so i think it's the same yeah totally look that's that's an interesting perspective for sure and i guess I, as like an extension of that where do you see the price point going? Do you think we've hit the rock bottom with quality flour whereby it's going to start to pick up again? Or do you think there might still be a little more to go? What's your suspicion? I don't really know if I know. I don't know if I have a good view for that. But I would say that what I think when that comes up is that, you know, indoor cannabis, which, you know, is easily more you know, popular or more desired or whatever than, than anything else, any other way you can grow it. That seems to be, there's a bottom to where you just, you can't produce it. You know, there, no matter how much you grow, there's only so much you can produce at a certain price. I mean, you can go, the more you produce, the more efficient you are, the lower you can, you know, um, the, you know, the lower the price can be when you sell it. But, you know, I think there's still a bottom. I mean, you still have rent, you still got electricity, you still got those things. So I I, just, I don't know how close we are to that, but it feels to me like we're pretty darn close, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think we're pretty close to that. We've dropped our prices. But now we've literally, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but we've literally succumbed to the cannabinoid levels being the price point. So now at Lucky Dog, when you come here, you can get when when the THC levels are here, you, it's this much. When it's here, it's this much. When it's here, it's this much. You know, I tried to, like, fight the power, as you say, and – tried to educate the customers but i'm just one guy you know the numbers mean everything to the to the folks who smoke they just don't they don't know it's our it's our responsibility to educate them but it's not as easy as it sounds it's easier said than done does that mean that like some of the more legacy strains like say like your durban poison your chem dog like it's sort of not economically viable to grow them now because they're they're going to be in the lower tier even though it doesn't reflect the quality or the demand well, the chem dog is always around 29, 30%. So that one always goes off the shelf, whether or not you've ever heard of it before people gravitate towards it. So, um, but legacy strains indeed, like we were, we've been pushing, uh, you know, we keep bringing it up, but the killer queen, we have that one. It's a really nice string, you know, and, and we've been pushing that on people and they'll, they'll come back and buy it, but it's like 18, 20, 21%. So people don't, it's that initial gravitating, you know, like, if you just were like, if, if people could just pick up weed and just smell it and be with it for a minute, you know, the way we, traditional we always have been, then it might be different, but they're just looking at numbers and they're looking at a jar with weed in it, you know, so they don't gravitate towards that stuff. You have to kind of push it on them and not really push it, but kind of, you know, turn them on to it really. Um, you know, it smells great. So just take a smell of this. But we always tell people here is like, listen, it doesn't matter how much THC. It has nothing to do with it. We have strains that are 18 percent. It'll fucking knock your socks off compared to, you know, the latest one you heard about that's at 31 percent. It's just it's not that simple. Um, can we explain it to you? No, nobody can because we haven't really studied it to the point where we understand it. But we tell them what we know. We tell them that, you know, the, the different levels and combinations of cannabinoids the different terpenes, you know, the combinations of them, they all affect the THC and the way it interacts with your brain. But, you know, at some point, like, we're just, like, talking to a wall, <laughs> you know, just to be honest, you know, like, it's just, there's only so much we can do to kind of push back on that, you know, it's just, it's, that's the way it is, you know, like, the states regulate based on THC percentages, they just do. So if that's the case, then that has to mean something to the consumer, and it means something, but maybe not as much as they think it means. And so they still grav gravitate towards the higher numbers, you know, like here in Montana, which, you know, this is Montana. Like this isn't like your standard American market. I understand that. But here in Montana, like even on the wholesale level, now it's trickled to that. It's like, you know, look at this amazing weed. Well, what's the COA? And you're like, well, here's the COA. And you're like, yeah, I can't sell that, you know. So 
it's kind of sad. I think it's kind of sad, but we're never going to stop. We're always going to have all those. They're going to be here. You know, we love them. They deserve to be showcased. We're not going to like fall in line and just grow high percentage THCs. You know, we're not doing that here. So, um, but truthfully, it does matter. You know, that's just being honest. It does matter to the bottom line. It matters, you know. Something which is sort of like the 50 to 100 year extension of that question that I've been thinking a lot about recently is, do you think that, you know, say in 50 or 100 years, we're going to get to a point where sort of like where the wine world's at, where there's only really like 40 well-known grape varietals that are grown and there's not really much grape breeding going on. Do you think we'll get to that point with cannabis or there'll always remain a demand for a much greater diversity of offering? I think, I think that that's where cannabis and wine and grapes differ. Um, there's certainly a, 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 a wide variety of flavor in the grape, you know, the wine grape world for sure there is. Um, but there's generally, I don't know how many strains that, you know, wine grapes started off with, maybe, you know, but you know, how many, how many different flavor profiles of cannabis? I think cannabis is different because of the flavor. I think, I think it separates a little bit. I think it's more of a, um, you know, a winemaker can change the flavor, you know, like soil uh, ter terrar can change the flavor of wine. You know, cannabis is different. You know, we grow it indoors. You know, we both, we generally use some semi-sterile medias when we grow. It doesn't have a lot to do with it. The plant itself does all of the, with certain environmental inputs and, and um, other inputs, I think that cannabis can demonstrate different flavor profiles, strain by strain, but generally the strains themselves with the variety is. So I, I, I actually don't think so. I think that we're going to probably have more strains than we want now, and we probably have more strains than we want going into the future even more. I think that's what separates cannabis and wine grapes is that, for whatever reason, there's just a wider variety of flavor in cannabis than wine, you know? Although there's a lot of creation wine grapes and even wines grown year to year, different regions are grown, all those things. But cannabis is more, it's, sim it's simpler, I guess you could say. It's like this strain tastes this way, this strain tastes that way. And they don't taste anything alike, but they're still cannabis. They're both cannabis, right? Yeah, definitely. No, and that's, a, that's actually a really interesting point. I hadn't considered that, yeah, the diversity of... Uh, flavor in cannabis certainly makes it a distinguishing thing before we move on to the grateful head which we'll jump into in just a moment i wanted to ask one last question which is that almost everyone i've spoken to who makes or sells seeds in the past say 10 episode has mentioned to some effect that it just feels like the demand for feminized seeds is ever increasing have you considered doing some fem work for the public or at least have you had any thoughts on it you know, we, we actually have, and we've uh, collected some pollen here, stored it. Um, definitely not against it, but um, I don't think I have any fresh ideas when it comes to feminized seeds that aren't already being done, you know. Um, but with that being said, we are definitely going to focus on making some feminized seeds this year. Um, we're actually, you know, STS spray is, you know, it's pretty it's pretty standard thing, but you know, we have our own that we've mixed up and we sell over it at uh, Breeders Direct Seed Co. Um, so, you know, we, we, uh, we're we definitely going to be selling some feminized seeds. We're going to be producing some this year. We haven't, we, we've produced it only enough for us to do a little testing in-house. In um, we need to get through those and pick which ones that we're going to put in production. But, you know, we, we uh, we're, there's nothing against them. They're just... There's nothing really, there's no new ideas there. Not that I have any fresh ideas with regular seeds, but uh, it feels more fresh than, you know, just taking two clone onlys and crossing them uh, in a feminized manner and selling the seeds. I mean, I think there's already enough of that out there. So it's not something that, it, it's not like a big passion. Of mine. I don't feel like it might pay the bills, but it's not like something that I'm like, oh God, I can't wait to see what we can come up with. Do you know what I mean? Sure. So it's, it's not like a fresh idea to me. Um, you know, I've grown some feminized seeds out. I, my experience, I've never been like super duper thrilled with it. I don't really agree that it's a way to like, um, making S ones. I, I, my experience and, and, and watching others that have made them and, and growing their stuff. I don't really feel like that's a great preservation method. I don't really feel that way. I feel like that tissue culture, um, 
you know, uh, synthetic seeds, you know, I think that's a uh, clonal seeds. I think that's more how I would prefer to do genetic preservation. Now we're starting to look into like cryo storage, which is really complicated stuff, but um, I'm not afraid of complicated stuff. I love complicated stuff. And, you know, to me, it's like at making feminized crosses, A, like I said, there's not really some, you know, like amazing idea of creation that I have more than what's already being done. Making S1s, to me, it's like I'm very like um, data oriented, logical oriented, like that's for preservation. But then when you look at it, yeah, it's a method of preservation, but it's like a last resort now in 2024 for me. And like, you know, 2010, it would have made a lot more sense for preservation reasons. But we have the like, cannabis has now entered into the mainstream agriculturally. And now we have real methods to preserve genetics long term. We don't need to do that. You know, so with that being said, I, I, uh, I do get a lot of questions about that. And I, you know, we have all the tools here. We have all the genetics here. We are going to make some some feminized crosses and some S ones. Um, definitely some Kim Dog family S ones. That way, you know, when you get your Kim Dog S ones, you get them from the Kim family and stuff. But um, you know, that's kind of how I feel about it. It's it doesn't inspire me at all. You know, it's just like um, it would be meeting a demand, but it wouldn't do much for me other otherwise other than maybe pay a bill or two. You know. Sure. No, that's understandable. You've got some other projects and let's dive into it. I mean, the last time I spoke to you, you were really passionate and talking about getting a lab going of your own. At that time, it wasn't this current manifestation, the Grateful Head. So I'd love to know, how did you sort of progress since that time to where we are now and get involved in this current project and tell us a bit about it? Um. Well, so of course, getting into it, like I told you before, it's uh, it was a personal thing. You know, when you have a lot of, when you have a large library, anyone out there who has one will tell you, it consumes your life. Um, there's no vacations. There's no, you know, there's no going away out of town without a lot of, you know, problems that you have to solve before you even leave. And um, you know, that's fine. But as time goes by, it's like, geez, man, you're getting older. You want to go have a life. So storage is really important. Like I said, we have a lot of cultivars here that will never leave our hands. We'll always take care of them, but they're not really popular at the time. Maybe they will be popular. We don't also don't really care if they're popular. They're just, they're standalone genetics that deserve to be preserved. And that's what we do. That's something that I'm known for. That's something that I'll always be doing. It's, I, I can't help it. I'm, I'm like a weirdo about it. I'm like a collector or something, you know? So, um, so naturally, like tissue culture um, is a way to do that. So, and that's like the basis of it. And so that's the motivation. And like I've said before, I went through a lot of, I talked to a lot of lab operators about their services and see if there could be some sort of partnership. And I just couldn't get past the parts of, I just couldn't feel it. You know, I, I just, maybe it's ridiculous, but I couldn't feel that connection. I couldn't feel that couldn't feel that honesty i couldn't feel like that real true let's work together for the plant um you know probably overthinking it probably i'm a hard ass but still so i decided to take it on my own a long time ago you know well, not a long time ago but years ago but it's a process so you got to teach yourself and i took courses i took training um i actually took my training in northampton which is where the chem dogs he was popped at, coincidentally uh, it turned out to be coincidentally, um, you know, learned how to do, you know, synthetic seeds, learned how to do nodal tissue culture, learned about the cannabis and plant aseptic practices, had some background on that because, I'm, you know, I've got a little bit of mycology under my belt for my own personal growing. And then, um, and then of course, Mary stem harvesting, uh, which is kind of the pinnacle of that for me. So, and then, and then learning about hormones, plant hormones, how to, how to, um, manipulate plants with hormones, cannabis plants. So, um, that's where it started. And it's like, okay, now what? All right. Now you got to get the lab going. So here at the shop, you know, we, we had a mother room and shut the mother room down, rented another spot across the parking lot here. Now that's the mother room, which is better size for the mother room and turned the previous mother room into a tissue culture lab. 
and got into it, started doing it, and started to find out that it was a lot more to learn than I even knew. Like, yes, we're clear of hop latent viroid here, but there's more to it than that. The, the pathogens that are really, you know, the, the ones that are really preventing you from seeing the cannabinoid potential, the terpene potential, and just the the, the, the growth potential, like those, the vigor, is, you know, they're, they're fungal endo endophytes, there's bacterial endophytes, and those things are systemic in cannabis. Some of them are beneficial to cannabis, and some of them, lots, most of them are not. And, you know, plants pick this up over years and years and years of storage in traditional manner, traditional cloning, um, traditional just mother rooms, you know, bringing in mothers, mothers leaving. There's all kinds of shit that goes on that we don't even see, stuff that we don't even have names for, really. And so as I started putting all my library into nodal tissue culture, I started to realize, because, you know, just to, just to like kind of make some understanding of that is that you know, if you're free and clear of hop latent viroid and, you know, other more serious viruses or, but really hop latent viroid and cannabis, um, you know, then you can just skip the Mary stem harvesting theoretically and just jump right into um, nodal tissue culture where as opposed to taking the Mary stem, in the case anybody doesn't understand this, the Mary stem is at the apical point of a plant. So the very new shoot that pops out. The very first shoot in any branch in any location has what they call a Mary stem at the very tip. And the Mary stem has got all the genetic, um, the genetic code of that cultivar. However, it hasn't been connected to the vascular system of the plant yet. So those pathogens that I talk about, the endophytes, the, the bacterial endophytes, the fungal endophytes, and any viruses or viroids, hop latent viroid, they haven't crossed over into that material yet. So what that means is that if you harvest that successfully and put it in vitro and tissue culture in a sterile environment to grow uh, with a nutrient rich, you know, agar, then you can grow that plant out from something the size of a pinhead. Um, you know, it's it's almost too small to see with your eye and um, it takes some time, but it will grow out of that. You know, we we can manipulate it with hormones to grow from that. If that happens and we're successful. Once those shoots start coming out after time, we can subculture those into other um, uh, sterile environments and keep the root system off of them, but still multiply them. Once again, um, you know, manipulating them with, with hormones. So I don't didn't really feel like I needed to do that. I started putting my library in, so I started doing nodal tissue culture, which means I'm just taking a plant and I'm taking a node and I'm getting rid of all the material I can off it, leaf, and leaving just a, the smallest part of a node. And then I sterilize that surfacely because I can't sterilize it internally, but I sterilize it on the surface with, you know, bleach, a bleach solution. Some people have used ethanol, but 10%, 15% to 20% bleach solution, 15 minutes agitating is usually considered enough. And then you put it into your, you know, all this is done in sterile conditions. You put it in your sterile medium, and then you can grow it. It'll start growing. You know, we've all seen that. I think most people understand what that is now. So what I found out is, is that even though I was free and clear of viroids, which is you know a piece of RNA, um, I did have like any plant will have that's you know any amount of time years old, you know, especially thirty years old, is going to have some bacterial endophytes in it, or maybe even a fungal there. And so I found that out. What does that mean? It means that so, OK, when you do any kind of like, you know, um, aseptic practice, you know, like when you do any kind of like tissue culture or if you're in mycology and you've, and you've done anything like that, you know, within a few days, if you have contamination, you know, you'll see the contamination growing on your media. Um, what a bacterial, a systemic bacterial endophyte will, will, will demonstrate, you won't see it for two, three, four weeks after you've determined your culture is uh, contaminant free. Um, so like I said, that, that was something I wasn't really prepared for. And what, what, that, what that made me realize is like, even though I don't have, I'm not dealing with hop latent viroid here at the time, knock on wood, um, you know, there's other things to deal with. And so even though you don't have that viroid, those other endophytes are what are making you or, or, or what's your, what you're seeing in the expression of your plant that is not what it used to be, you know, decline caminoids, decline, ter decline terpene levels, those types of things. 
this more finite, you know, of the what's going on with the plant. You know, when you put a plant into tissue culture, there's a couple things going on. First off, if if you if you successfully initiate a plant into tissue culture, and you don't see any you know fungal growth, and then eventually you don't see any bacterial growth, well, and then you don't grow any roots um, on a plant because that's how it is in tissue culture when you're multiplying. Well, the plant has time, and by the way, the, the growth is slower. We can even slow it down with cold storage, which is really beneficial when it comes to um, allele um, repair, DNA repair of a plant. So when people say, oh, these plants, you know, they came from Gen Zero tissue culture. Look how much vibrant they are. Look how much vigorous they are. Wow. They're growing faster than all these other plants, including the clone, the traditional clone plant of the same strain. Well, the reason why is because, you know, the plant has had time to repair some of its DNA, something that, you know, I don't think humans are very adapt at doing, but plants are. Plants are Plants are so adaptable that it's beyond, you know, we, we don't even understand the, the adaptation qualities of a plant. Like we don't even appreciate it yet. You know, we don't even think about it. But if you were able to look back to history and the evolution of plants and, you know, how they've come from the beginning of time to now, you know, it's, it's fascinating. It's really amazing. But one of the qualities they've done is one of the qualities that a plant has is it can repair its, its alleles, basically, and, and kind of repairs DNA. But also, if you're able to outgrow any of those endophytes, you know, one example is, you know, when you take clones, you know, people who take lots of clones will understand this. You know, sometimes you'll get like this brown slime on your clone, your, your roots. You don't understand where it comes from. It doesn't make any sense. Well, that's a fungus. And sometimes that fungus isn't even in the air. Oftentimes it is also in the air, but it can also just be systemic in the plant. And when that plant, that um, cutting pops out roots, well, those uh, those endophytes go to work and they start propagating. And then so you're starting to see a fungus there. So that's what I'm talking about, like that type of stuff. You can eliminate those things with with, uh, you know, quality tissue culture practices. You can. And that's kind of the goal. So when I when I to back what I was saying, so when I discovered like, oh, man, there's more to this than I thought. I was like, I'm going to have to take my whole library and put it into Mary, like harvest the Mary stems. I didn't think I was going to have to do that because, you know, we test here um, at the facility. We have the we use Tumi, and now we use Tumi Glow so we can test right here in 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 house for hop latent. That way we can get regular testing and you know just make sure. You know we do bring in new clones, so we have a, a protocol for how they come in and you know the time period before they can be tested and the time period before they can be introduced to the main population and you know i'm big on redundancy so i keep we keep the practices here as if we have problems because we you know just because we don't have hop latent here doesn't mean that other things can't be spread so we use the same protocol for sanitary conditions regardless of you know what's going on at the library regardless what the testing tells us the testing just tells us where we're at you know it doesn't give us like you know, I've seen people out there, they go, oh, I just tested my whole crop and I don't have to worry about this and this and this in the protocol. And I, I disagree with that because, A, we don't, you can test a plant several times before you find out it actually comes positive because the way hoplate and viroid uh, spreads around a plant, um, you know, it starts at a, at a wound usually um, more, I think more often than people realize it actually comes from the root system sharing wa water runoff. So you don't always know, you know, like you can you can make the wrong guess, as I say, when when you make that decision. So it's better to keep the protocol in place regardless of what the testing is. You know, the people who come in, you know, my guy, ginger grower who goes and takes some cuts, he doesn't know if I have a negative or a positive. You know, we always we don't have any positives, but there's no need to tell him because I don't want him to get comfortable around, you know, the plants because he has a false sense of security about it, you know which can easily happen. And I can't say for sure either, because if we're bringing new plants in, even though they go through the protocol, hop latent affects different, affects different cultivars differently. So just because it grew super fast in this Maui dog doesn't mean it's growing fast in this whatever, you know? So some plants, it hits them really hard and fast. And some plants, they can, you know, I mean, sour diesel, I've seen this with my own eyes. Um, you know, it, it can be severely infected and still produce cannabinoids and still produce terpenes, you know, at high levels, it can be really difficult to just know that you have it, you know, 
And so even though I've never tested that particular plant um, for hoplite and viroid positive or negative, I would say that you would probably get, you know, you'd get different results on the tighter levels. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you may not know. Not every test may be able to pick it up and you may not even test the right spot. The tests are getting better. You know, now we're testing the roots, um, which I think is, you know, a step in the right direction. You know, it, 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 it's better to understand how things work as opposed to guessing, you know, and there's been a lot of guessing and now we're starting to understand things that, you know, hop and virus starts in a part of the plant and then it goes to the root system and then eventually it spreads to the new growth and then from there it spreads to the older growth, you know, but not always. That's just how it usually works. So the point is, just do the protocol, <laughs> you know, clean your scissors, clean your hands, 10% at least. It's okay to use 20%. Get yourself some scissor sharpeners. It's going to dull your scissors, you know, take the time, you know, sanitize your hands, give it a full 60 seconds. Why not? Think about what happens if, if something goes wrong. It's worth the time, you know? So I'm getting a little sidetracked here from your question. I understand that. But uh, the point is, is that, um, I built the lab here. It's functional. We're doing what we got to do. But then once that door opened and it's been, I've been working on that door for two, two plus years now, as far as, you know, when I, when I do something, you know, for, for cannabis in my career, I make sure I understand it top to bottom. You know, I make sure that, you know, it's easy to go hire someone who can do something for you or understand it for you i that doesn't work for me i don't sleep at night with that i sleep better at night if i understand it top to bottom and then i know the right questions to ask i have the right answers when i'm asked questions and so that's what i've been spending my time doing you know and i've been learning a lot and then that's kind of what's led to what's happening now you know because i realized that even though i try to do everything myself and i try to keep everything in-house like i just described it just doesn't always work out that way sometimes you need a team Sometimes you need people around you who have the same goals in mind. And, you know, that's kind of where my life is at right now. I've, I've that paradigm of it's OK to have a team, not just, you know, not just people that are hired. You hire to do what you need them to do, but like a team of people that are thinking the way you think that are approaching problems the way you approach them. It's very valuable, you know, because not any one of us is dealing with this on our own and it will only get dealt with as a community. You know, um, it's bigger than people realize. It's more rampant than people realize. The faster weed goes into this legal space, the more education is going to be required to deal with the things that we have to deal with, such as hoplite and viroid. And there's going to be more pathogens that are going to be as detrimental or more detrimental than this so we have to like we have to be prepared to meet those challenges and this is, this is like for me hot plate and viroid and watching how it's affecting folks in the world and the potential damage it can do to a business to you know a cultivar um it's just like training wheels for the next thing you know it's like get the protocols get the right frame of mind and especially the right team around you to be able to to be prepared for what's coming next because there will be something next and it may not be as simple as you know cleaning it up with the mary stem tissue culture remediation you know so i think i think i got off track there but you, you know i think somewhere there was an answer <laughs> <laughs> you did predict my next answer which was going to be asking you do you think there's going to be another virus in the future and the answer you said was yes so before we jump back to where we were, I want to quickly ask you, I've heard anecdotally that after a particular genetic undergoes uh, meristem tissue culture, just again, anecdotally, people say, oh, you notice it's better. And the number I heard was like maybe like 15% better in terms of like across the board, not in one particular aspect. So, you know, like maybe it's more vigorous and maybe there's a bit more yield and a bit more terps and just sort of, you know, like 15% better. Have you, would you say that it's more than that? It's about that? What's your thoughts when you hear that? It's all relational to where you're starting from. Um, you know, if you've got a plant, I think the Gorilla Glue number four is a great example, right? I, from, from what I gather, that was a big culprit of a uh, sick plant getting other plants sick. It got spread around really quickly at some point years ago. And I think that a lot of people 
spread around that hot plate and viroid at that point, you know? So to use that one as an example, it's like night and day. I, I would say 50%. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience with it before. I had some, but not a lot before we got the clean version we have now that's basically a uh, came from a Gen 1, you know? Um, but it's night and day. It almost doesn't seem like the same weed. Same weed. Like you'll show it to people who tell you that, you know, Gorilla Glue was always one of their favorites. Oh, I remember the Gorilla Glue. And then you show it to them and like, what is this? And you're like, it's, it's the same one, you know? So I think maybe on an average, I don't know if I could answer that, but I think the potential is, is much, you know, much greater than that. You know, it all depends on where you start from. If it's, if it was a, you know, sort of sick plant or sort of not well, or maybe not that oval plant, maybe, maybe the difference isn't that big. But generally, it's it's like night and day, you know. Like it's it's the vigor is it's completely out of control, you know. I mean, you can see it on the the, you know, the the the, the stems, you know. You can see it on the stalks. You can see it like it's just vigorous, more lively. It looks like it, it looks like it was just popped right lit not that long ago but from a seed, you know. That's just what I've seen. And just as a quick follow up, how would you compare the difference between say doing the nodal harvesting versus meristem? Is there quite a big difference when you go to that meristem level mm, so it, it not necessarily because like i said if you have a generally clean plant and then you initiate it uh, nodally uh it's you're not gonna you know you're not gonna see a whole lot of difference when it comes out that plant was pretty clean when, when it came in so you're not gonna see a lot of difference between a mary stem gen zero and let's just say i don't think that's a real term but a nodal gen zero you know a uh, plant that just came right out of tissue culture. But let's say that plant, you know, because when once you're in Mary stem, you know, really you're just mostly what when you go through tissue the tissue culture process, you're eventually going to get rid of all those fungal and bacterial endophytes, like I was saying before. The Mary stem is more for going in. The Mary stem is more for just like um, you know, remediation. It remediates, you know, all those fungal bacterial endophytes, but also more importantly, that's the the only way that we have currently to remediate from the viroid, you know, the viruses. So it's kind of like comparing when you're talking about the way you described it, like apples and oranges. But at the end of the day, you know, it's going to be about the same because the the genetic repair that it goes on and then also the cleaning up of the endophytes, the bacterial or fungal, that's going to happen with the with the nodal too. Um, the Mary stem, we would just cut to the chase and just do that anyway, even if we didn't have the viroid, because it's an, a quicker way to guarantee that we're not going to bring any of those bacterial or uh, fungal endophytes into the culture. Do you understand what I mean? Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, definitely. 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 So, or I mean, just to quickly bring us back to where we were, how did you essentially get involved in the Grateful Head Endeavor? How did it all start? Because you, you've told us it was on your mind. Well, you know, that's funny you say that because I believe that we kind of manifest our reality, you know. Um, I'm one of those that believe that we talk things into existence, that we think things into existence. And so, yeah, this is on my mind constantly for years. And I've gone through a lot of the labs and, you know, I won't mention any names, but you've heard of them all. And they just couldn't make me feel comfortable with who they were, what their goals were. And, you know, how that would affect me in a partnership with them. And so I, like I said, back to what I was saying, like I tried to go at it my alone and sure I could do that, but it seems like it's bigger than that. So while I'm thinking about this, I, uh, I like to post on Instagram. Like when I open up my Instagram feed, it's mostly laboratories that I'm, that, that the algorithm wants me to see. It's not, it's not the pretty flower. There's that too, but mostly it's laboratories, techniques, you know, and it's outside of cannabis. It's, you know, petunias and begonias and, you know, fruit crops and all kinds of shit like bioscience, like, you know, agricultural science is fascinating to me as I've gotten to this point in my life. It's just it's kind of where my, you know, it's just what interests me, you know? So plus with the tissue culture thing, the algorithm knows what I'm thinking. At least it can figure out what I was thinking yesterday. You know how it is. Um, so I liked the post of a fella, uh, and he he immediately hit me up. He was like, we should talk. And I was like, all right. So I called him up, and that's not – you know me. That's not something I do. It's hard to even get me on the goddamn phone. But I called him up, and we just hit it right off. And, uh, 
you know, he was pretty forward in inviting me to, to join the, the cause. And, um, you know, I, I kicked the idea around. It's, it's, you know, the last year I've gone through this uh, year, last year and a half, I've kind of gone through this paradigm shift in my own, my own universe, you know, is, uh, I used to be like, you know, I've been collecting clones and, you know, taking care of them and, you know, spending every resource I have to make sure they're safe. Even sometimes the last fucking dollar to make sure that the plants are fine. Forget about me and my, you know, so, um, you know, it's a big deal to me. And, you know, like I've gone from, you know, these things are so valuable. How do you put a price tag on it? How do you sell to someone else? You know, like, how do you like, 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 what, what use does that have? You know, like selling a genetic to someone, you know, like selling a clone of, of a clone only that you can't get to someone like what use does that have? I've, I've always kind of felt like that was no real use to that, you know? Um, yeah, they're going to go off and make a bunch of money with it, but that's it. Like, is that really, is that really all it's for? And my mind was like, no, it's not. And so I kind of always tended not to share genetics, clone only not to share, you know, you know, my library with folks, not to sell it, you know, even though I could at any time, I just chose not to. And over the last year, I've been kind of watching the industry and kind of watching, you know, one by one breeders start to sell their, you know, their breeding clone, you know, their, uh, so, you know, their selections and, you know, then you go out on the internet now and there's like clones everywhere you can buy them. And then, so my girlfriend started buying clones from people because I'm such a anal f person that I wasn't even like sharing with her. <laughs> and, uh, you know, next thing you know, there's hoplate and viroid popping up and, you know, now we're dealing with that and trying to like, you know, protect the library from that. And I'm like, God, these, then you call the company up and they're like, we don't test for hoplate and viroid. We don't, we don't have the money for that. What do you mean? You sold the clone for $500. You don't have the money for that. It just blew my mind how careless some of these clone sellers were being, you know, I just was like, Oh my God. Now this, we're going to drop to this fucking level now. And so over the course of the last year and a half, I've just kind of come around to the idea that, you know what, maybe, maybe it is a good idea if we do it right. You know, maybe it is a good idea if we are good stewards of the plant and sell clones that are clean, sell genetics that are clean and, and like well taken care of and verified, you know, there's that too. Like you never know what you're getting and at a fair price, you know. Um, something that makes sense for us and uh, keeping it for so long and holding on to it and all the resources that we committed to the library, but also, you know, to make sure that the guy with the tent in Texas can, like I, I mentioned to you before, can afford it and get that fucking headband or whatever the fuck it is he wants in his tent, you know, without spending, you know, breaking the bank, spend thousands of dollars or whatever it is. So as I'm coming to that kind of paradigm shift in my head and just different way of seeing things. This whole thing happened where I liked this post and this fellow, you know, reached back to me. We're on a phone call. We're talking about it. And I just, of course, my first like inclination was kind of to push back and like, you know, JK, be, be careful, you know, like people say things and, but it just, I just kept, it kept fitting together like a puzzle, every conversation. So over the course of like two months, we started talking and, you know, like quite often about it. And I was taking it very serious, the idea in my mind, in my personal life. And I was bouncing off my family and, you know, the people that I trust and care about their opinions. And I decided to go for it. You know, I decided to enter into an agreement with the company and be part of the, uh, you know, part of the board of directors on a company. And it just, once that happened, it was like a bowling ball, as we say, just started rolling down the hill. There was no way to stop it, you know? Um, and it, it's like, it's brought me such a relief from the pressure that I was putting on myself about this, that, you know, there's been a lot of great things that are coming from it. And we haven't even, you know, we're just getting ready to do our first drop this summer, um, August 5th. But, you know, in my own personal life, just the mental pressure has taken off me knowing that it, I'm around some men uh, who feel the same way that I do about all this, completely understand like where we're coming from when it comes to the plant and protecting it and like what it means. And, you know, even the guy who approached me, you know, he had like, I, I don't want to over speak. I don't know the exact, but he had like say 150, 200 cultivars that he did that did get infected. Well, you know, what, what's the protocol say? It says throw them away, start over. Right. He chose not to do that. 
he reached into his back pocket and he reached deep and he went to a lab and he got his whole fucking crop remediated. And like, I, I have so much respect for that. You know, that's what I would do. I can say that but that's a whole different ball game to face that reality, you know? And he did that. And like that, that, um, that had an impact on me uh, dealing with this gentleman. And so I realized that I'm not the only one and that there's other ways besides doing it yourself. So I joined, joined forces and, you know, here we are now, now what's happening is like, we're, you know, now we're trying to keep up with what we, what our plan is. Like I said, it's like a snowball just going down the hill a hundred miles an hour. We're just trying to keep it up, you know, keep up with it. So it's like the most exciting thing I've been part of since I can remember. And, um, you know, that's, 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 that's where it starts, you know? So it's all brand new. This all just happened since April. And, you know, I feel like we've been doing it for years already, you know, just because of all the details and work we're putting into it. That's that's really exciting to hear. I, I, I mean, we're going to have to talk a whole bunch more. I guess the first question is, I'm sure people have maybe seen some of the other content you've done out there. But if not, uh, I'm aware that you're doing it with uh, buddies of the show, Dutch Blooms and Kevin Jodry. Can you tell us a bit about some of the other people involved and what each person brings in their capacity, so to speak? How's it, how does it all work logistically? So that's pretty much the basis of it. It's We're all collectors. We're all you know, long term, long term, like cannabis enthusiasts, collectors, and you know, just people who love the plant. Um, so the, you mentioned, you know, mentioned Dutch Blooms. You mentioned Kevin. I think you know, folks have had some exposure to them. And I know Kevin is an amazing human. Like I, I uh, of course knew who he was, um, but now I've gotten really, I've gotten to know him to a degree being part of this company, we meet every week and we discuss our plans and kind of our ideas. And I mean, it's, it's like a wildfire. Like when we get together, like we take the smallest little notion of an idea and within an hour it's blossom into this giant garden of a, of a, of an idea, you know, it's, it's insane. And it's all because we've been around this plant for so long. We've been around cannabis for so long and we've been involved to different degrees. Um, so, you know, generally saying, speaking, we all have our own personal libraries that we've thrown into the collection. Uh, there's, there's one person that, um, that you didn't mention, and that's the guy I was talking about. And his name is, is Steve. And uh, we've gotten to know each other, and he's an amazing guy, man. He really is. He's, he's, uh, he cares about cannabis as much as plants, as, as, as much as anyone I know. And it, this is kind of his brainchild, and he kind of brought us together, you know. Um, He's a good networker and he's got good ideas and great energy and he's kind of brought us all together and, um, you know, made it to where it, it's like, it feels like a team. Like he, he did it the way to where we all feel like it's like a, an equal team, you know, and it is. And so it's the four of us. Um, there's a few other people involved. We you know we have a CFO and, you know, we have a lab partner, um, that we, have to, that we're doing all the the culture and the remediation at it's a big big endeavor it's really a big project you know um and we're lucky to have a lab that that has taken on that work um you know when you find someone that can do this kind of work they have a you know usually a pretty extensive scientific background and this individual does i would imagine there's lots of avenues in life that a person like that could take a lot of opportunities and and um has chosen to work with cannabis is kind of admirable to me and so um, we're lucky to have that. Of course, you know, things are always moving. They're always, mo you know, motions are always have, have happening. Um, so we're all being in cannabis. We're all accustomed to that. So every time there's like a bump in the road that we see, we have like a million ways to deal with it. And the best part about it is it's not on just one person. You know, it's a team like, you know. No, no one person has all the ideas. No one person has all the solutions or answers. But when you put some people together that I, you know, this is my experience. When you put some people like that together, smart people who, you know, are engaged in what they do and they care about what they're doing and they have passion for what they're doing, fucking magical things happen. It's almost like, it's like I said before, like speaking things into existence like that on steroids. It's like, wow, look at this. It's just growing so fast. It was all you can do is say, wow, this is just meant to be. And then, you know, the motivation, I think, for a lot of us is, you know, how it's being done wrong everywhere just across the board. 
and by people who may not quite under quite get it i don't know how to say it you know just may not quite get it the way some of us do and i think that only comes not because people are so different but because of experience uh around it like seeing what can be good and what can be wrong and being able to kind of navigate those those things when they come up i think we're all adapt to that and very good at, at very good at dealing with that um and you know you know me i'm i'm a hard ass you know i'm a i'm a purist i'm a and I don't like to fuck around. I'm not trying to like, you know, but cannabis is going in a certain direction and you can either kind of ride, ride that you can kind of hold on or you can not, it's up to you. And I'm trying to find ways within myself to make it better for cannabis in general, based on what I believe, but not just hiding behind my keyboard or my closet, bitching and moaning about what's going on. You know what I mean? But as opposed to like, as opposed to that kind of like, influencing it and changing it and maybe having a positive impact on the outcome and i think that we're all all of the grateful head and the the people who are involved with that myself included we all have that in our back of our mind always you know um that you know it's better to work within a system to change it to make it more better as opposed to just sitting on the outside screaming and pounding your fists and saying it's not good enough you know and I've been on the outside doing that to some degree, but I've always known it's better to be on the inside doing it. And I feel like the Grateful Head has an opportunity for us to do that. Like, you know, we are going to be providing Gen Zero clones. We have a library. It's almost 600 cultivar clone only deep. And it's growing fast. See, that's the thing that, you know, um, I could talk a little bit about is that the, the part that's snowballing the fast is the library, you know, because of the reputation i think that some of us have that that we have individually it's kind of it, it's kind of added to the kind of the, the validity of the mission that we're on when it comes to cannabis and the, the you know genetic we're, we're genetic dealers basically you know like that's what we do we collect and deal genetics that's what we do and um there's a lot of people doing that and there's a lot of people doing it just to quickly make that quick dollar without any regard of, you know, tomorrow or seven days down the road or seven years down the road. And I think that we kind of have a, for some, for various reasons, we have a little bit of a vision of that. And I think that we're able to kind of apply that to what we're doing today. And that's why I'm involved with this because I see a lot of that, you know, I don't have to make excuses for people. They're already on the right page from, for, from my point of view, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, it's it's growing fast and it's going to be it's going to be big. We have already, I would probably guess the biggest genetic repository of clones. Forget about Gen Zero, forget about tissue culture, forget about the remediation, forget about all that just in globally. And um, we're going to be able to sell these clones legally to basically anybody uh, the way we have it set up with our licensing here. Um, I'm not going to get too much into that, but we are basically able to sell clones to anybody that has a phytosanitary certification agreement um, globally and certainly anyone in the United States. So the way I describe it is if we can legally sell you a clone, we're going to you can buy a clone for us. And our library is extensive. So our first drop is going to be. Um, it's between 40 and 60. We had 60 pulled for it, 60 different cultivars pulled. Um, it's a matter of production about if we meet that number and we're getting, we're getting some feedback and data on that this week. Um, but I think it's closer to 60. Uh, we just want to make sure we have the numbers. We're only going to have about a thousand clones available on the first drop. These are all gen zero. <clears throat> They're partially acclimated. So when you receive your clone, you're not going to have a lot of work to do acc acclimating it. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We have a nice SOP for that. We're going to have, we're going to surround you with instruction just in case, just to give you the best possible uh, outcome. But it's, um, it's going to be, they're going to be rooted, viable. There just needs to be some small acclimation. These are sterile plants coming out of each row with roots. You just got to, you know, it's going to be, specific light requirements, specific feeding requirements, and specific, um, you know, humidity requirements for the first seven to 10 days, you know. Um, I, I couldn't be more excited. I'm so pumped about it. I feel like I'm part of something bigger than myself, and I love it, you know. 
That's awesome to hear how excited you are. I mean, there's so many uh, interesting follow-up questions I want to ask you. I guess the first one is, as you mentioned, there's this like vast library of genetics contributed by the various people you just mentioned. Uh, who's handling the lab side of it? Are you guys doing it in-house? Are you partnering with someone you trust? Who's going to be doing the culturing and making the clients? The culturing has already been going on for years now. Um, the intake is uh, ongoing and it will always be ongoing um, because we're going to be trying, we're, we're trying to not just take existing libraries, but we're trying to find ways to leave the door open to new cultivars. You know, sometimes, you know, as you've noticed, I'm sure most people can notice, it's like the next greatest thing doesn't always come from the biggest known breeder, you know, well, you know, Oftentimes it's freaking bag seed that someone finds in their, their garden. You know, it's just the reality of it. So we're developing ways to make partnerships with breeders known and unknown alike to make sure that we leave the door open for that material to come in. And also that that person who provides that material is compensated properly for the material, you know. Um, and those are things that we're developing. We don't have any, like, we don't have anything to discuss about that yet, but that is like at the forefront of what we're doing. It's, it's not so much what we have. We do have that. And it's, it's, that's the, the wheel that's turning now, but it's the future, you know, like the next thing, the next genetics, the next big thing, the next trend, you know, the next, and then, you know, on top of keeping like the old school, the classics um, around and available to people who some people, have never experienced and now they will have an opportunity to experience. Now, uh, as far as the lab goes, um, one of the things about uh, collecting genetics, I think the key word for collecting genetics is called is redundancy, right? That's how I've kept things alive and available all these years and, and somewhat healthy state is redundancy. So we don't, we have a main lab. We're going to be working out of Connecticut because of the laws there. Uh, they're very favorable um, as far as, working under so we're not we're not under fda regulations the food and drug administration of the united states but they're the ones that set the rules for hemp uh regulation in the united states hemp is is uh, legal 100 percent in the united states um states have the opportunity to do nothing about that and then if that's the case the fda's regulations which are strict um they super they, they take play they they uh, they go into effect you know that that's the rules that you're going to be working with when you propagate sell hemp or hemp products um, if you are in a state that most states in the United States have added on top of rules of the FDA hemp guidelines um, and so Connecticut is one of those states that has um, but however they've they've been very favorable to hemp in that state there's some states that are you know, more concerned about synthetic uh, cannabinoids and are trying to overregulate hemp based on, you know, like uh, Delta, you know, Delta A products and things of that nature, you know, synthetic cannabinoids that were derived from hemp. So they've kind of overstepped a lot of their regulation uh, mandates to try to regulate things that aren't really just hemp, you know. So Connecticut is one of those states where they've been very friendly. So we do have a lab there. Um, and it's it that that lab works with a lot of different plant cultivars, but they've housed, remediated, and stored and multiplied the cult of the, the lot the existing library that we have. Like I said, intake is ongoing. So the next step for the Grateful Ahead is redundancy, meaning you know um, we're we're developing other labs. We're thinking about here in Montana, here at Lucky Dog, but we're also thinking about. You know, maybe it would be a good idea to have our Connecticut lab stand place. It's there. That's like the main spot. But then our redundancy could be a West Coast, you know, a mountain zone, a central zone. Um, so that way we can cut down on shipping time to uh, have higher success rates through shipping. You know, a lot of times when you send a clone to the mailers, you know, you never know what's going to happen. You know, like someone could just leave the shipment in a, in a van and it could get cooked. There's not much you can do about that. So if you can do what you can to cut down those shipping um, lanes times, you know, and also have re uh, redundancy in your, in your project. Um, I think that'd be useful. So that's our next step, you know, so the lab is in Connecticut and, 
you know, we don't really talk about much more of it is it's kind of like the safe house as a, so to speak. And the thing that we're focusing on now is the redundancy. Like, where's the next lab going to be? Where's the next lab going to be? And, you know, how do we build it? You know, how do we make like a, um, you know, like what plan would we that, like work here, here and here? You know, like what do we really need to get it going? What do we really need to have it in operation and production? And let's focus on that. You know, so that's we're already at that point where that's the next step. You know, um, like I said, it's growing a lot faster. We expect it's going to be a pretty big um, demand once we release and people start to see the product that we're providing and the library, the extensive library. And so we're already trying to think about the next step because we can already see that we're, we're going to outgrow ourselves pretty quick here, you know? Okay. So you, do you plan to always just have all the labs in house so you can have like your own SOPs and keep the sort of consistency high? Yeah. Um, the IP is shared with, you know, our, our lab that's been developed. It's been shared with us to a degree. We're developing, you know, basically our own IP based off of that and, and a lot of other input. And that will be something that belongs to the Grateful Head. Um, but yeah, there won't, I think, I think you know, there's been a lot of discussion about that. And I think going forward, we've realized that a partnership is great, but it's just a stepping stone to what we really need to do. And that is exactly what we said we needed to be in-house, you know, full control of the IP, full control of the the process, um, you know, from from A to B, A to Z. I mean, you know what I mean? Like the whole thing. Um, I don't we've you know, it makes sense to have those partnerships and we're going to be we'll have those partnerships along the way. But, you know, we've we've come across we actually know a lot of you know, we, we have a lot of resources in that space in the uh you know, biotech space, uh, plant tech space. And so like, as we've kind of let this idea blossom, we've realized like we have a lot of resources to where we can kind of build a team in house, like you say, and let and rely on that to do the production and remediation and, and so forth. So yes, we, we plan on keeping it in house. Right now we're in partnerships, good partnerships, you know, but, um, but I think going forward, we're going to be the next step and the next step after that, we're going to be in-house, you know. That's exciting. And look, as you referenced earlier, it sounds like there's going to be a huge amount of demand for this and it's probably going to sell out quickly. I've heard mentions of August being when the first drop might occur. I took a look on the website. There wasn't any real specific info. When can people expect to be able to get their hands on these? Our targeted date is August 5th. Um, we think that, you know, there'll be like a two week period between August 5th and, um, you know, August 20th, 21st, where the plants will be available. Uh, that's a pretty solid, that's, that's a set in stone time frame. Like we can't get around that, <laughs> you know, whatever we have, when that happens, that's what's for sale. Uh, that's what's available. So, um, that is the time. Now, as far as the website goes, like we, the Grateful Head, the, the, hyphen grateful hyphen head.com i believe that's what it is i don't think that yeah and uh so that is the place where you'll be able to order your clones we're going to have all the forms of payment available and um the list is not up yet like i said we want to make sure we have a hard number before we offer anything on the list we have thought about doing a pre-sale um that may or may not still happen i'm not sure um, generally speak, generally, I don't think that's going to be something that's going to be, you know, a reality. And we're going to have a deal on this first drop. If you buy four, then you will get a fifth for free. Um, so that's going to be kind of sweet. We think that's going to be a nice kickoff to it. The clones are going to be priced this round $250 for one Gen Zero clone sent to you. We're not selling plants. We're selling genetics. We if and we are going to spend plenty of time explaining and showing and demonstrating why that's an amazing deal. You know, like uh, one little trip through our lab with a with a phone camera, and you can see exactly why that's going to be an incredible deal. You know, and that's only if you can't imagine if you can't you know put you know imagine all the things that have gone into this cultivar being safe and clean and ready to go, uh, brought to your door. Um, besides that, you know, so. That's kind of the deal. So yeah, right now we're gonna have a pre-sale, but all the all, every when the list is available, 
we'll make announcements on Instagram, the website, everywhere we can to make sure everyone knows, you know, where they can go grab their, their clones, you know. Sure. And look, the question that I'm sure everyone has on their mind is, will people be able to get their own Chem 91 or are there some plants that will remain off the list? Nothing from my library is off the list. Um, you know, the, there was never a point. Once I, w once I went to the flip the switch in my head, you know, it was never going to be. So we're going to be doing fun things like we're going to, you know, have like a, a Kim family collection that you can purchase, you know, like a box set kind of. Um, not on this first drop, but on, on, on you know, uh, drops down the road, we'll be doing that. We're going to have clusters, you know, like say you're a um, – say you're a business and we we can come and check your market with you we can assess your market basically your library your existing library your existing sales your cultivars and then we can provide you clusters of plants to kind of hit um you know different zones uh in cannabis you know like you know like candy gas you know those types of things you know we can break them up for you um you know legacy we'll throw a legacy in there for your connoisseurs that kind of thing. So we're going to, you know, one of the things that we're going to be doing is for commercial customers, we're going to be kind of helping them, you know, kind of guiding them through their own market space to help them figure out what will work and what won't work <clears throat> with, you know, with trying to, to, you know, um, limit any kind of, uh, um, you know, conformity, like any kind of, uh, Redos like you know try not to saturate too much candy you already got enough of that try this this will work in your candy market watch what happens you know like you know we we all one of the things that we all have is we have like a sense of that like we kind of been around long enough to see the trends come and go and so it's not that difficult for us to identify them when we're given the data when we're presented the data and you know of course we have assessors we work with that can help with that too so um, no the Kim ninety one will be available. Uh, right from my library, um, not on this first drop, but just because uh, there's a there's a process to this and the pipeline was already going, but there's going to be a lot of cool shit. Like my whole library is going to be there. One of the cool things is, is um, one of the best things about being involved with this as a breeder is this is going to free up a lot of resources for me to get back to selecting seeds, something I you know, I never have enough time with. It's always on the back of my mind. It's always in the front of my mind. It's something I think about when I wake up is how, you know, it's what's, I mean, isn't it like, what's more fun than pheno hunting? I don't think really anything is when it comes to cannabis. That's the most interesting thing about growing cannabis to me is when you get to go pheno hunting, I rarely get to do that, you know? Um, so I'm looking forward to that. When I get this library buttoned up and it's not a hundred percent my responsibility financially and otherwise to take care of it, then I, it allows me to free up. So that means there's going to be a lot more cultivars. There's going to be a lot more genetics for us to go find and present to people. Those will all be included too. You know, um, there's a lot of things that the world hasn't seen that are in our libraries that are going to be available right off the bat. You know, that's really exciting. And I guess if I push you, you still can't let us know any of those forty ones that might be up front. I want to. I want to throw my guess in the ring. I reckon TK's got to be in there. We have two TKs in there. Ooh. Good guess. We got the Swamp Boys. We got, you know, Ricky's TK, and then we got the, the, the traditional TK. So the Swamp Boy TK and then the original TK, I guess, or whatever you call that one. Huh. I wonder what that is because I thought Ricky was the one who found it. I would have thought his would have been the original. That was one of the questions I had when I saw this. I've learned a lot about stuff I didn't know about coming, you know, about clone only being involved with these guys like, I'm getting schooled daily. I, I have to listen, you know, because <laughs> that was one question I asked. I was like, wait a minute, there's two? Yeah, there is. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I can't wait to check out the Ricky TK because the Swamp Boy TK because I've heard great things. These guys are telling me it's like a they've seen people getting 3.8 pounds of light from it. And I'm like, what? That's not the one I got, you know. So, yeah, I can't wait to grow some shit in this library too. That's another thing being involved is like having, having all these different clones that, you know, maybe I've heard of, maybe I've dreamed of, but right there at my fingertips, I'm, I'm fucking excited as someone who likes to, you know, make crosses and do a little breeding here and there, you know, that it just opens up a whole new world just for me, myself and I, you know, and that's, that's a great example right there. 
yeah, and that was going to be one of my questions. You know, given you've got this new collaboration, we've got access to this range of genetics. Are there any clones now available to you that you were sort of always eyeing off, going, "Oh, I would love to have run that." Oh my God, there's so many of them, man. Like I should have a list in front of me to answer that, but yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, there's one that caught my eye that that, that they have is uh, that I don't know who brought it to the table, so to speak. And you know, that's the other thing we don't really. Um, right now we have it all bunched up into one list and you know we're still trying to sort it out in different ways you know kind of like how many different ways can we organize this to where someone can click on a link and they can go oh yeah you know because it, it, it's so extensive it doesn't it's not very useful just to scroll through it you know like you need different ways to kind of filter it out so we're working on that with the website so ways you can filter it out with all these different categories um, but there's one, I think it's an NL2, the red pheno, that I cannot wait to check that out. I don't know where it came from, but I believe it came from Seattle at some point, of course. But uh, um, but I'm looking, that one caught my eye, and I, that's the only one that comes to my mind when you ask me that, you know. There's a lot, though. There, it's, it's extensive. It's insane, you know. It's like you got to, like, you got to sit down with this list when you look at it because it's a lot, you know. And it's growing, it's growing at like a pace that none of us expected, you know. Sure. And, and like how quickly do you estimate you'll ramp up to full production where you're offering, say, a good majority of the library? Right now, uh, the, the plan that we have in place will be producing for sale for uh, a thousand clones a month right now. And, and that may change upwards depending on demand. But right now, that's what we're told of this. You know, the process to get these out of tissue culture, multiplied, rooted, partially acclimated on time, it's a it's a pretty, you know, long process. So, you know, it, it's a, it's basically on the production side, like a three month lead time, you know. So these are the ones that we're going to put on the, on you know, on the list in three months. OK, now let's start the process, you know. So um, the goal right now is a thousand clones a month starting in August. Wow, that's exciting. And and like I gotta ask, do you think you might ever foresee a day where you would consider shipping like the Meristem in the Agar, or do you think it'll always be like a clone? That's a good question. Um, yes. So we want to be able to provide our material to, you know, people in many different ways. Um, we're gonna have males, you know, breeding males. We're gonna have males that are available. We already have plenty in the library. Uh, there'll be more. Um, I'm going to be committing some mails to that part of the library as well. And then, you know, one of the things that we would encourage people to do is take your clone and then put it back in, you know, culture it, put it back in a subculture, right? Um, and if we do get enough, um, so what that means is like, so I don't want to take this clone out and expose it to to the world of pathogens, I want to keep it in vitro so I can, at my own house or my own facility, I can keep this going. Well, you could take this clone, put it back in the vitro. It's barely out of it. Um, and then you can continue to, to uh, multiply it. And then you can provide yourself with clean clones constantly, clean Gen 1 clones all the time. Uh, so if we find interest in that, yes, we will be providing cultures on, on plates, actually. Uh, for people who have that skill level in order to know what to do with those and how to handle those. Um, every which way we can think of to provide these, we're, we're going to implement. Uh, like I said, even males, you know, like breeding males that people may want to breed with. Like we're not, the door is going to be completely open. That's the idea. Like this is a decentralized um, genetic repository. Like we're not holding back. We're not, we're not interested in you being a return customer. We're only interested in you being a happy customer you know we know the joy people get when they've been looking for you know such and such cultivar they've they smoked it you know 20 years ago 15 years ago or just the other day and they just want to grow it themselves we're here for you that's that's you're our you're our person you know we want to help you with that you know like that's we know the joy of that and we want to bring that joy and that's a big part of what we're doing here and uh so if we find that there's people who want to have material provided to them in vitro then certainly we'll do that you know that's exciting as well to also hear about the the males that will be on offer i guess 
soon enough you'll you'll be offering absolutely everything. I had a I had a really good fan submitted question that I wanted to ask you, and they were sort of thinking, look, I'm planning to buy one of these clones. Do I need to scrub my medium first? You know, because obviously some of these viruses and endophytes can exist within soil and other mediums. Do you think if you're going to go to the effort of getting one of these clones, it's worth just cleaning shop, getting a new medium? Or do you think, oh, look, you're probably safe just to put a clean clone in? You can certainly, well, I mean, you. it, it depends on what we're talking about. I mean, if we're just talking about a regular grow room, there's no reason why you can't just put it in there. Um, once you take a clone out of vitro and you start multiplying it outside of uh, aseptic conditions, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. However dirty or clean your grow room, it's going to happen. It's not, it's basically like, it's like hitting a reset button, you know, like you're going to hit the reset button, but that doesn't mean you're going to be golden forever. Still life goes on. Um, I always, I, when I think about it in my mind, I think about it like cassette tapes. This may be, I might be too old for your audience here when I come to this, but back in the day when we had Grateful Dead tapes, you would get the recording on a DAT, a digital audio recording, right? Digital. Um, that would come from a taper that was tapped into the soundboard or even their own microphone. Then they would take that tape and they would record that onto a cassette tape. That's Gen 1, right? Then if you did it again, it's Gen 2. You can hear the sound quality. Diff you can hear the difference between Gen 1 and Gen 2. And then we would put Gen 1, Gen 2, you know, however many gens it was from the digital recording, we would put that on the tape and we would, uh, you know, put that on the tape so the listener would know what the quality is that they're listening to. So I kind of related to that in my mind. Um, you know, the data is still there. You know, the information, the genetic information is still there. But the further away you get from Gen 0, no matter what, it also, it, of course, it has to do with how clean your space is, how clean your practices are. Those are always going to be in, in play. But it's going to pick up things along the way no matter what, you know. Now, if you think about, like, the Kim dog, I've had it for 30 years now. So if you think about that, how much crap has the Kim dog picked up along the way? I mean, 30 years is a long time. But then you hit the reset button. And so tomorrow, with the, with the, the Gen Zero clone that you get from the Grateful Head, now you started off your 30 years ago, right? Potentially 30 years ago. So now you have a whole, we already know what 30 years of, can do to the chem dog. We still got it. We still love it. Um, we love it so much and so much times by, we can't, we can't say for sure that it's changed a whole bunch since day one, but we know it has, you know? Um, so it's the same thing. It's just like hitting the reset button. You just erase all that time in between. And it's literally just that, you know? Um, so, I wouldn't say you have to do anything special. The only thing special you have to do is follow the SOP and the instructions. We're going to have a nice little video. We're going to have the information that comes with your clone. It's going to be on the website. We're going to beat you in the head with it just because we want to make sure you have success. I've sold, you know, I've been around people who've sold clones a lot, and I've seen some of the issues that come up with just traditional clones being shipped and, and provided to people on mass. And, you know, it's like you have to be aware, like when you're been doing this as long as I've been doing it, there's a lot of things you just don't think about that a person who hasn't been doing this long comes across. Right. Like just things that are second nature to me, like things that are obvious, you know, they're only obvious to me because I've been doing it for so long. And so someone who hasn't, they're not. So we're just trying to make sure that all the things that should be obvious to you will be, you know, part of your plan once you receive your clone. I want to go forward. Like I said, it's just a matter. It basically think of it like this. You have a rooted clone, but you're going to treat it like it's an unrooted clone for seven to seven to 10 days. You're going to acclimate it slowly over seven to 10 days, even though it's got roots. Um, you can also, you know, you can also treat it with trichoderma and other um, beneficials to kind of inoculate its own immune system. These plants are babies. They come out. They don't really have an immune system. That's why we have to acclimate them. You can speed the process up. We'll have the instructions in there. You can, you know, put some basic, you know, stuff you can get at any grow store, sometimes at a hardware store, to inoculate the root zone to kind of defend it. You know, the theory with inoculation is if you occupy the state, the space with beneficial, you know, uh, fungi, bacteria, then that's a space that a pathogen that's detrimental can't exist in. 
So even on that basic level right there, you know, we can we have ways that we can avoid any problems. Um, but these are partially acclimated, which is beneficial. And you'll have about seven or 10 days where you have to keep high humidity, low light, low EC feeds and lots of observation, you know. But this is your baby, so it shouldn't be no problem. We're going to give you step-by-step -step instructions and lots of support along the way, you know. I like as a follow-up, uh, it's a sort of a similar question in a way, but maybe a bit more um, of a real issue where someone added a follow-up to that first fan question, which was, do you also need to be wary of popping new seeds in your garden? Because, you know, like uh, a hop latent virus can be transmitted via seeds as well. Do you think, again, you need to be careful of that if you're going to try to start clean with these clones? I don't really think you need to do anything different, um, you know, than your normal protocol when you're avoiding that. Like, if you pop seeds, seeds have, there's still, the data is still out on hop latent virus transmission of seeds. It certainly can be transmitted, but we, you know, we don't have a, we don't have an actual study yet that we can refer to, but the numbers range between, you know, eight percent to 40 percent i think is the latest i've heard of transmission on seeds depending on if it was the mother or the father i think if it was the mother i'm just i may not be correct about all this like i said it's not all in concrete yet but i understand that if the mother's infected the higher it's a higher rate of transmission than if the father was infected of course more than likely you know uh, just you know, of course, the mother would be the one that's more likely infected than the father, but that doesn't mean it's always the case. So um, I would say that people who are conscious of hoplite and viroid and its, and its damage um, are already careful with their seedlings, you know, making sure they're not possibly transmitting anything that was on those seeds until they can get it to testing, which, you know, you can do as soon as you have roots nowadays. Um, we used to have to wait till we have true leaves with petioles and then we could, you know, take the petioles and then test those. But now we don't even test the petioles. We're uh, testing the roots now. Um, so I think that if a seedling had hoplite and viroid, you know, in transmission when it was created, I think that you, as soon as you have roots, you could find that out. If you were concerned about popping seeds and hoplite and viroid, as long as you understand that you can test that seedling pretty early on, I don't think there's much concern there, you know, as long as you're willing to, Follow your protocols if you have them. If not, you need them. Um, once again, you know that's bleaching your material. I mean, bleaching your uh, your uh, your tools, scissors, pruning scissors, bleaching your hands. Ten percent minimum for a minimum of sixty seconds. So you keep your scissors in your bleach water. Ten percent. I like to do like fifteen percent just to give it a little extra. Why not? Um, and you can go up to twenty percent and. But the, con the uh, contact time of 60 seconds is crucial. Um, and then another thing that I've noticed a lot of people have not been, you know, privy to yet is the runoff water. So you want to make sure that you're not uh, sharing water from one plantlet to the other, regardless if it's a seedling, a clone, you know, plants. It doesn't matter if you think, I mean, not even if you think, you just don't want water from one plant's runoff exposed to another plant's root system. So when you're cloning, that can be challenging if you have multiple strains or if you have seedlings uh, in, you know, seedling trays, same thing, you know, that, ex that presents a problem that's very difficult. So um, one trick I've learned I should throw out there is, uh, you know, those Grodan uh, taller orange they use the AOK. I don't know if you have those there, but anyone in the United States is going to know what I'm talking about. They rise up above the, the seedling flat um, and they keep them separated. Then you space them out every other um, cell you'll use. And this is not a bulletproof you know, solution. The best thing to do is to keep each plant in its own tray. But that's not always, the, you know, even here at the facility, we, we have different strains in a single tray. But then when you water them, you know, we used to like just flood the trays with water easy enough, drain it out. You don't want to do that anymore. You know, it's been years since I've done that. It's been years since I've had that, uh, you know, that easy way of watering my clones. So what I do now is you can take a turkey baster and water each one individually. Um, that takes that takes more time. And all of this takes more time, of course. Um, but one thing I've learned is you can take that tray out. 
and I'll put it like on a on a metal wire rack over a sink or some other kind of catch pan, and then I'll water it from top down with a, a dram seed waterer. So that's like a, a a shower head, but a really small one meant for seedlings, so it's less pressure. And then I'll just do a top down, so all the runoff just goes right into the vessel. That's a quick way of doing it. Use a lot more nutrient solution, but hey, you know, it's a lot cheaper than remediating for hoplite and viroid or even dealing with the nightmare of it. Um, that's a trick I've learned that I, I can share. But as far as what you're asking, your, your uh, listener asked about the seeds, I don't really think there's anything special you need to do here. You know, I, I really don't. You just, you always want to have the protocol. You want to always act like you have hoplite and viroid, even if you are pretty sure you don't, because you're never 100% sure you don't. It can show up in plants weeks after you've tested you know uh, like you can test and um you can test a plant hoplite and virid it can be you know plants can outgrow it it's a tricky thing it's not it's not something you can see it's not something you can you know have any kind of sense of you just have to assume it's there it's like electricity you can't see it but you're not going to go touch that thing you know you have to treat it the same way you have to, you have to develop your protocol i mean i'll be happy to help and that's something i always think i remind myself i should do is kind of make one for people to share um but so you know i don't think there's anything special about seeds you don't really have to do anything special you know just i guess the reason i say that is because you should already be doing whatever it is that you have to do to keep your space clean you know you want the best chance for success you know like use bleach <laughs> lots of it you should be on top of it already. I like that. I like that. All right. Well, look, I got one more question before we jump into some of the final ones before we wrap things up. And I think it's a good question, actually. One of our listeners wanted to know, do you have any predictions on how the launch of the Grateful Head might affect the seed market? And I myself thought, you know, some people might have a knee-jerk response and think, oh, everyone will be able to do their own TK cross. Great. But I also think the opposite is true as well everyone now has access to a super rare Malawi that they maybe otherwise couldn't get. And you could get some really unique offerings coming out because people have such a greater access to genetics. Have you thought about this? Do you have any predictions? What's your thoughts? Well, I'm, you know, as you know, I make seeds. It's, you know, one of the things that I do. So I have thought about it a lot, um, even before the Grateful Head. And, you know, I've, we've all seen this trend of more and more clones becoming available, maybe because of the hemp, the uh, Farm Bill Act allowing plants to not be cannabis anymore. Now it's hemp um, because you, there's no THC in, in plants. Um, but clone onlys have been, you know, I've seen the trend where more and more of them are available. Like I was saying earlier, the thing is, is, um, you know, how are the producers doing it? Are they, are they, you know, are they selecting things to produce that are, you know, what they're supposed to be, you know, um, are they are they using clean practices, you know, to make sure they're not, you know, it's a big responsibility to start selling live plants to people because you could potentially wreck their world with a disease. I mean, you could you could really mess things up for humans and for you know regions of fucking cannabis. Um, so I I have thought about that. So I would say that the uh, availability of clones has definitely affected seed sales. I I've seen. I've seen a few breeders kind of uh, closing up shop, I believe, recently in the last few weeks. You know, I can't say that it's related, but I assume it is. Um, but on a larger on a larger picture, I'd say that it's actually going to help because, you know, breeding is not centralized. It's there's not it's not Coke and Pepsi. You know, um, breeding is is vast. I mean, anybody can create amazing fucking shit. We see it all the time. We see people. All the time come out of the woodwork with amazing you know uh you know genetics to sell in seed form uh things that they've created things that are unique um so i think there's gonna be more of that i think that the grateful head is going to further decentralize uh genetics um not only in clone onlys that we offer but also the creations that come from people being able to obtain clone onlys that were previously on un un uh, unobtainable for them you know that were unavailable to them uh, for whatever reason. So I, I've thought about this a lot, and I really do think that it's going to open up the doors to, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who breed and sell seeds who are going to, you know, wish that this kind of thing wasn't happening. But it's one of those things where, you know, the writing's already on the wall. We didn't put it there. It's already there. 
this is where we're going. This is just the next evolution in cannabis. Um, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, you know, people weren't sending clones like this. They weren't doing that. But now it's, you know, you turn on Facebook or you turn, you know, Instagram or even Facebook. You know, I don't go on Facebook, but uh, I had a friend I had to wish happy birthday. And I went on there and I was bombarded with, uh, you know, clone selling advertisements, you know. You know, so it's like it's everywhere. It's becoming mainstream. And um, I think as far as breeding goes, this is going to open up the door to more unique breeding projects because, you know, from my perspective, I, I, I guess I kind of apply it to that. Um, you might have like a great idea. Like you may have smoked a, a cultivar that, you know, a friend had or, you know, smelled some weed that someone had or whatever. And you're like, geez, you know, that kind of gives me an idea. Like if you took this and did that and then crossed this, that might be something amazing. Like that was, that's the thing I'm looking for that would make this project. That's kind of, you know, in the back of my head, like in my dreams, in the back of my dreams come to life. But, you know, to go get that cultivar or to hunt it down, to be part, you know, to get it into your life, that could be a process and along with that. So I think that when you eliminate that part and you can allow someone just to simply thumb through a library, their creativity can get sparked. I know that, like I said, I apply it to my own way of thinking. And I, I think that it's just going to open up the door to more interesting. I think, you know, we have, you know, cannabis is, you know, is really kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, we, we, we could use more variety. I think you know? like it seems kind of weird to say that, but, but honestly, even with all the different cold doors we have, there's, there's really, there's a, there's some, there's categories that kind of dominate the, the, the space and they're not that different, you know, they're there. And then even the stuff that the older schools do, like the chem stuff, like it's not that different from each other, you know, like, um, I think that it's going to kind of make a whole new categories. I really think that there's possible that it's going to make whole new categories of flavors out there, you know. But I think that the guy, you know, who's passionate about cannabis, who's, you know, got the day job and he's got the family to attend to, but he's got the tent. I talk to guys like this all the time, selling seeds to them. You know, I constantly am always emailing these folks, answering their questions. And like, to me, they're the ones that have the most passion, you know. They're the ones that have the most, like, you know, heart in it. And I think that they're the ones that are going to bring us the next fucking amazing thing. And that's that's why we're trying to keep a contact, a connection, a relationship with those fellows and ladies. Because they're the ones that are going to bring the next thing to the table. And we want to be part of it. You know, we want to help them show what they do and what they're capable of and what they've done to the world, you know. So I don't think it's going to, I think it's going to change the seed game, but not in a bad way. I love that. I love that. So now I'm going to turn the tables on you. You have to pick just three clones for the rest of your life from the Grateful Head collection. What are you going to pick? Oh my God. Let me Google it. Just give me a second, all right? <laughs> that's a long list, dude. All right. From the Grateful Head collection, you say, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, I want that Swamp Boys Triangle Kush in my life. I can't wait. And. That Northern Lights, it's a Northern Lights five, number one, stone fruit red pheno. So that's number two. That was quick quick to number two, huh? And then I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with that Cheetos. Ah, unexpected. I like it. Yeah, because I just I it's been a minute and I wanna I wanna see some of that cat piss stuff, you know. So there's too much. Pick three is hard, but I'm going to say those. There you go. I like it. I like it. Okay. Um, next question is, have you had a chance to taste chem dog after being through tissue culture? Yes, I have. Yep. And it was different. It was phenomenal. It was really, there was another layer that, I, that I've been missing that I've missed over the years that was there, you know? And I mean, that was a while ago. That was one of the inspirations to get involved with you know, my own library before all this stuff that's happening now. Um, like, wow, this is real. Like I, I've told you before, like I started messing around with tissue culture in like 2006. We, we had no idea the potential of it. We just didn't know in cannabis, you know? And, um, um, and that's where it's at. That's what's amazing. Um, that, that's, uh, that, that, that's kind of one of the inspirations that was like, man, this has got to happen. Like there's something more here. 
you know, when I first started this, like I never, when I first dabbled into tissue culture, I didn't even consider, you know, all the benefits to the plant's health. You know, it seemed to me more of a way of a storing, transporting, you know, simple shit, you know, stuff that it's really nothing to do with, you know. Um, tissue culture has been around for over 100 years. Um, every banana you eat comes from tissue culture. Lots of the fruits you eat, strawberries, you know, all these things are propagated. Orchids. Um, lot more and more things are being, you know, house plants. All house plants are, you know, it's just a really efficient way of propagating at the base, and then more advanced. It's a way, you know, a lot of the plants don't. It's not necessary to keep them around forever, <laughs> you know. Like, you know, I, I don't know about bananas and strawberries and such, but you could probably replace a lot of those things if you need to. Um, cannabis isn't like that you know there's certain cultivars that you cannot replace and well none of them you can really replace and so the ones we love anyway and so when i discovered like the the vigor the the the, the flavor coming back you know all that stuff the, the aroma you know and kim dog was the one that turned me on to that of course because i have the most experience in my life with kim dog so in my mind's memory i have a timeline of you know, whether I can perceive it at any given moment doesn't matter. It's there of like where we started at, what we fell in love with and what we're what we have now. You know, so when I experienced that, you know, the vigor of, of, of a plant that came out of tissue culture been cleaned up in such a way. I mean, it was night and day. I mean, it's 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 a big difference. I mean, it's you can't deny it. It's unreal, you know, and it's amazing. It's like a time machine. It's like going back in time. You're like, wow. And what a miracle, you know, like you can't do that with humans. You can't do that with animals. But you certainly can do it with plants. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. What a beautiful and powerful sentiment. Final question for this one. How are people able to get in on this drop that need to check the site daily? Is there a firm date? How are we doing it? So you can check with uh, uh, any of our Instagram accounts, we're going to make sure that we're, the announcements will happen there. So skunk underscore VA. Um, then we have uh, at the Grateful Dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start over. At the Grateful Head LLC. That's our Instagram page for the company. You can check on Kevin's. You can catch uh, Kevin Jodry's Instagram. You can check on Dutch Blooms, Dutch underscore Blooms, I believe it is. We'll make the announcement, you know, in a uniform way when it's time. When we we'll make the announcement when we have the list to look forward to. We don't gonna we're not gonna just drop the list on people the day it needs to go up for sale. We want to give you enough time to kind of thumb through the list and you know make your plans to make sure you don't miss out or anything like that. So uh, sometime at the end of this month, um, we'll make an announcement about when the sale will happen. The clones are all in the. Um, the production part is going smoothly. We're at the part now where we have roots and we're beginning to do acclimation. Um, you know, you want to get them to a certain size where they can ship. We're not, we're not going to be sending you like little tiny plants. A lot of people have been asking me that question. Um, I've been getting that a lot. You know, they've gotten tissue culture plants. So they're like little tiny like sprig of a plant. These won't be like that. These are going to be more substantial like clone type plants. Um Tissue culture plants are coming from vitro, sterile conditions, so they're not exactly like a traditional clone, but they're going to be more substantial than a lot of times what people have seen. Um, but we're on track, and we're not going to say a date because these are plants. We want to make sure that we don't stay to a timeline where we stick more to the plants, you know, the needs of what the plants need. So um, I think in the next two weeks, I don't want to overstep my, my boundary here, but I think in the next two weeks we'll be announcing the list as we get the numbers counted in and then and then august 5th is still our target date um and then it'll be about a two-week period uh before the plants are no longer viable for sale anymore that is incredible both in practicality and in the excitement sense i think that just about brings us to the end of it for everything we we're going to chat about today any comments or shout outs you wanted to make i don't think i have anything man just i'm really glad to be back with you and congratulations on your life and uh and all the stuff happening and you know can't wait to release these clones man i'm so excited i've never been so excited about something for as long as i can remember that's really exciting it's palpable and look it's it's something that's going to be a game changer for a lot of people and i'm sure as it evolves 
we'll see the uh, the full the full extent of it all. So, as usual, a massive massive thank you for coming on for sharing your knowledge. A long time friend, prolific breeder, grower, the man behind Lucky Dog Seeds, and the newest venture, the Grateful Head, a part of it, I should say. A big thank you to Skunk VA for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate you. And there you have it, my friends. I hope you enjoyed it. A massive thank you and shout out to our friend Skunk VA for taking the time to join us today. And a massive thank you to you for making it this far and for supporting us. I appreciate it deeply. If you love this episode, please consider supporting both the Patreon as well as the websites of our incredible sponsors. If you're looking to transition from combustion to vaping, check out our good friends at Dynavap. You will not be disappointed. Cheap, affordable, and incredibly efficient units. Likewise, check out our friends at Pulse Sensors if you want to make sure that your garden is dialed in and you are tracking all of the variables that are going to ensure your next harvest is the best to date. You've got to get yourself a Pulse, guys. It's a no-brainer. In order to ensure that your garden is pest and pathogen free, please check out our friends at Copet. They are the number one in biopredatory technology. The Spidex Vital sachets have been a game changer. The slow release of Spidex Vital will make sure that your garden is spider mite free. Copet, thank you so, so, so much for your support. Likewise, a big shout out to our friends at Organics Alive for all the most incredible powdered organic products usable in all systems, both organic and hybrid. People winning cups around the globe with their products, it's no surprise because the quality is second to none. A huge thank you to Organics Alive. We recommend them highly. Please check them out if you want to take your organic game to the next level. Finally, massive shout out to our good friends at Seeds here now. They've got Heavy Days Beans. Go check them out, guys. I promise you will not be disappointed. They've got all the latest drops, the hottest breeders, Fem, Auto, Photo Period, CBD, whatever you need, they're here to help you out. A massive thank you to our friends at Seeds here now. And big love to the Patreon gang. We love you so much. Thank you for supporting the show. They got early access to this episode over a month ago. If you want to get extra content, please consider supporting the show. You'll score yourself genetics, a whole bunch of swag from our sponsors, and so much more. So that just about brings us to the end of it for this one. A big thank you to you for getting to the end yet again and for the support. Big love as always from your boy Heavy Days. Signing off. See you.